Once upon a time, two young children named Xiao Fan and Jing Yu found themselves transported to the celestial realm. Accompanied by a guide, they journeyed towards the revered Paragon Daoxuan, the master of the Qing Yun sect. The guide explained to the youngsters that since the passing of the sect's founder, Grandmaster Qing Yunzi, the once thriving Qing Yun sect had experienced a decline. He conveyed that despite losing the sect's territory, the Qing Yun sect had been subjected to bullying from other factions. He pointed out that, among the seven peaks of Qing Yun, only the sky reaching peak remained unclaimed by enemies. 1300 years ago, Paragon Qing Yun changed the course of history by creating the world's most formidable killing formation, the Celestial Destroyer Sword Formation. This powerful formation swiftly vanquished all adversaries on the six peaks of Qing Yun Mountain, turning the tide in their favor. Xiao Fan expressed amazement at this incredible feat, while Jing Yu pondered the significance. The guide shared that ever since that remarkable event, the Qing Yun sect had been upholding the banner of justice for 50 years, eventually rising to become the leader of all righteous sects 200 years later. As they approached the Yu Qing mansion, the guide suddenly urged Xiao Fan and Jing Yu to gaze ahead, pointing out the entrance to the mansion. Witnessing the massive gates, Xiao Fan expressed astonishment, admitting he had no idea such grand gates existed. The guide then instructed them to enter. Passing through the gate, they were greeted by a breathtaking sight, leaving them in awe. The guide explained that in front of them was one of Qing Yun's six scenic views, the Ocean of Clouds. To Xiao Fan, the scene resembled a fairyland, and Jing Yu remarked on the ridiculously immense size of the place. The guide chimed in, explaining that Qing Yun Mountain was renowned for harboring extraordinary talents, attracting numerous aspiring disciples each year. He noted that, aside from the main peak, the other six peaks housed their own exceptional disciples. Xiao Fan concluded that these disciples must be strong, to which the guide agreed, acknowledging that Xiao Fan had a keen insight. Expressing his desire, Jing Yu wished to become a disciple of the Qing Yun sect. The guide reassured him that joining the sect wasn't overly difficult, but required patience and a good understanding of their teachings. Continuing their journey, they reached another of Qing Yun's sceneries called Rainbow Bridge. The guide announced their arrival, and upon seeing the vibrant bridge, Xiao Fan and Jing Yu were delighted, expressing their amazement. However, the guide cautioned them to be careful, highlighting the potential danger of falling, which momentarily shocked the two children. Suddenly, Xiao Fan and Jing Yu heard a strange sound, prompting Jing Yu to ask Xiao Fan if he heard it too. They were on the water bridge, observing a water hole forming in the water. Abruptly, the water surged, giving rise to a water horse, leaving Xiao Fan and Jing Yu frightened. Curious, they inquired about the mysterious phenomenon. The guide respectfully informed the water horse that Xiao Fan and Jing Yu had been summoned by the master. After hearing this, the water horse turned around. The guide reassured Xiao Fan and Jing Yu that everything was fine now, and they were free to proceed. He explained that during Grandmaster Ching Ye's efforts to restore Ching Yun sect's glory, the Water Kulin had been his right-hand companion, often referred to as the Spirit Immortal. Jing Yu reminded Xiao Fan that it was time to continue their journey. They eventually reached the master of Ching Yun sect, Paragon Daoxuan. The guide respectfully informed the master that he had fulfilled his task by bringing both Xiao Fan and Jing Yu as instructed. Suddenly, Xiao Fan spotted someone he knew named Wang and called out to him loudly. Xiao Fan approached Wang and questioned if it was really him, seeking answers about the tragic events from the previous night that led to the death of all the villagers. Worriedly, Xiao Fan inquired about the whereabouts of his parents. Do you want to know the name of this manga, along with all the manga names of the recaps we did in our channel? How about also the chapter numbers our recaps end? You can simply ask the names in our Discord community for free, or become a donor, to get them all in one place. You can either be a donor in Patreon, or be a member in our YouTube channel. Just scan this QR code, or go to the link in the description, to become a donor. Moreover, becoming a donor automatically makes you a VIP member of our Discord server, with over tens of thousands of members. Jing Yu intervened, telling Xiao Fan that it was futile as Wang had already lost his sanity. Holding Xiao Fan's hand, Jing Yu urged him to approach Paragon Daoxuan. Seated before the master, Jing Yu acknowledged that despite their youth, they understood the gravity of the situation. He emphasized that Dao Xuan, with the ability to perceive both the past and the future, needed to intervene on their behalf. Xiao Fan, addressing Dao Xuan as Grandpa Immortal, implored him for assistance. The onlookers wondered how Xiao Fan could address Dao Xuan as Grandpa Immortal. However, Dao Xuan, with a grin, clarified that he couldn't see into the past or future. He acknowledged the tragedy that had befallen the temple village at the foot of Qing Yun Mountain and assured everyone that they would take action. Dao Xuan revealed that the entire village had been brutally attacked, with Xiao Fan and Jing Yu being the sole survivors. Jing Yu expressed his lack of awareness regarding the events that transpired. Upon returning to the village, Xiao Fan woke him, and Jing Yu, upon regaining consciousness, shared that he had no knowledge of what had happened. Dao Xuan observed their lack of information about the previous night's incident. Consequently, Dao Xuan summoned a man named Song Daren. Upon his arrival, Dao Xuan instructed Song Daren to recount what he had witnessed, being the first to notice the occurrence at the temple village. 
Darren recounted that on that morning, upon returning from their errand, they were flying on their swords when they noticed the temple village turned into a scene of bloodshed. Bodies lay scattered everywhere, prompting them to swiftly descend and investigate. Another person in their group pointed out the dire situation below, urging them to reach the village quickly. Upon their descent, Darren identified the culprits and discovered two children who were still alive amidst the aftermath. Darren added that they later discovered Uncle Wang, who had already lost his sanity, near the village's latrine. Curious about the extent of the tragedy, Jing Yu requested Darren to count the number of corpses. Darren responded, revealing that, aside from the three of them, all 42 households in the temple village had perished. Xiao Fan and Jing Yu, upon hearing this devastating news, became deeply saddened. To provide some solace, Dao Xuan used his magic to lull them into sleep. A man named Tian Buyi, the chief of the Great Bamboo Peak, addressed Dao Xuan, acknowledging that despite putting Xiao Fan and Jing Yu to sleep with the sedative orb, they needed a plan for when the two woke up. Dao Xuan turned to another man named Chan Song, seeking his opinion on the matter. Chan Song responded, suggesting that it would take some time to unravel the situation. He proposed the idea of taking Xiao Fan and Jing Yu in as disciples. Dao Xuan approved of Chan Song's suggestion, noting that it aligned with his own thoughts. Contemplating who would be willing to accept Xiao Fan and Jing Yu as disciples, he voiced concern about the two children sharing a traumatic past and suggested placing them in different locations. Tian Bu Yi, chief of the Great Bamboo Peak, offered to take in one of the children, explaining that his peak had a limited number of disciples. As Tian Bu Yi considered choosing Jing Yu, another man named Shang Zhengliang, the chief of Daybreak Peak, intervened and held his hand. Shang expressed to Dao Xuan that he felt as though fate had led Jing Yu to him. He proposed the idea of taking Jing Yu as his disciple. Tian Yun, in response, informed Shang that his peak already had over 200 disciples, and, if fate was responsible for each of them, then fate must be quite busy indeed. Tian Bu Yi concurred with Senior Tian Yun, acknowledging that his Great Bamboo Peak only had seven disciples. The Chief of Dragonhead Peak, Paragon Chan Song, chimed in, emphasizing that Xiao Fan and Jing Yu had recently undergone a significant tragedy. He urged them to prioritize the well-being of the two children instead of arguing over the number of disciples each peak had. Paragon approached Dao Xuan respectfully, expressing his recognition of the boy's talent. He willingly offered to take him under his wing, pledging to provide the best guidance possible. Paragon mentioned that this gesture would bring solace to the departed villagers. Daxuan acknowledged Paragon's positive intentions and agreed to allow the boy to join Paragon's peak. Curious about who would accompany the boy, Daxuan inquired about Xiao Fan, the one responsible for taking him. Bu Yi pondered about who would be willing to accept the inexperienced guy. Others in the group shared the sentiment, thinking that Xiao Fan didn't have to be taken to their peak. Daxuan intervened, addressing Tian Bu Yi directly. Daxuan informed him that he must take Xiao Fan under his wing. He explained that it was Daxuan's disciple who had observed the incident in the temple village, and fate seemed to have led the boy to him. Daxuan urged Tian Bu Yi to bring Xiao Fan to its peak. After hearing the unexpected news, Bu Yi was taken aback, and when he attempted to respond, Daxuan swiftly halted the meeting. Bu Yi then collected Xiao Fan and started heading back. As Bu Yi observed Xiao Fan's expression, he handed him over to Song Daren, instructing him to take the boy back. After entrusting Xiao Fan to Daren, Bu Yi soared away on his sword. Daren advised Bu Yi to take care of himself before turning his attention to Xiao Fan, referring to him as a little junior. Daren mentioned that he still didn't know the boy's name. The next morning at the Great Bamboo Peak, Xiao Fan woke up, feeling as though he had been asleep for a long time. As he opened his eyes, he looked around, trying to figure out his surroundings, experiencing a mild headache. Suddenly the door swung open, and he sensed someone entering the room. Xiao Fan approached the door, attributing the movement to the wind, and closed it. As he turned away, a sudden presence startled him, and he discovered a girl behind him. Xiao Fan, feeling frightened, inquired about her identity. The girl responded, claiming to be the legendary demon girl. Xiao Fan became even more scared and questioned the possibility of such a conversation. Xiao Fan continued screaming in fear, prompting the girl to advise him to take a breath before he choked himself with his screams. She found it amusing how quickly Xiao Fan fell for her trick. Suddenly, Xiao Fan, overwhelmed with fear, accidentally wet his pants. The demon girl questioned him, asking if he had just wet his pants. Xiao Fan apologized, explaining that it was unintentional. Xiao Fan began running outside, expressing his need to go outdoors. The demon girl retorted, stating that running away was merely a dream for him. Swiftly, she tossed a rope toward Xiao Fan, securing his feet and drawing him closer. As she pulled him, she noticed something on his magical weapon. When the demon girl ceased pulling him, Xiao Fan saw an opportunity to escape. As he resumed running, Darren, holding breakfast, was approaching from outside. Xiao Fan accidentally collided with Darren. Surprised, Darren inquired if Xiao Fan was awake, expressing his expectation that Xiao Fan would be glad to see him. Curious, Darren asked why Xiao Fan was running, and in response, Xiao Fan explained that he was fleeing from a frightening demon. Darren reassured Xiao Fan, advising him to calm down and attributing the experience to a possible nightmare. He insisted that Xiao Fan join him for breakfast, and mentioned that afterward, they would go to meet the master and mistress. Concerned about Xiao Fan's well-being, 
Darren pointed out that he had been asleep for a whole day and must be hungry by now. Despite Darren's words, Xiao Fan remained convinced that what he encountered was not a mere dream. Eventually, they both arrived at the Hall of Serenity, where additional individuals were already standing. Among the group in the hall, a boy named Bishu lamented his loss once again in a game. Darren admonished him for his gambling habits, cautioning that he would face trouble if the mistress discovered it. Bishu, noticing Xiao Fan, assumed he was the new junior and complimented him for his outstanding presence. Darren then took the initiative to introduce Xiao Fan to the rest of the group, providing their names one by one. Darren proceeded to introduce Xiao Fan to the group, listing their names as Wu Dai, Zheng Dali, Hidaji, Lu Daxin, and the last one, Lin Bishu. Xiao Fan courteously expressed his pleasure in meeting them all. Curious, Xiao Fan questioned Darren about why the name of the sixth senior was the only one not starting with Da. In response, Darren revealed that the sixth senior's name used to be Da Shu, and suggested that Xiao Fan would understand the reason if he tried calling him by that name. Laughter erupted among the group when Darren explained that Da Shu meant uncle. He disclosed that the mistress deemed the junior Dua's name disrespectful to his elders, resulting in a change to Du Bishu. Encouraged by Darren, Xiao Fan tried addressing him with the new name. The humorous attempt elicited laughter from everyone, including Xiao Fan himself. Du Bishu mentioned that he had ceased gambling for money since joining the Qinyun sect, and now engaged in it purely for enjoyment. He questioned what was wrong with that. Just then, the mistress and master arrived in the hall, accompanied by a girl. Darren warmly welcomed them all, informing the master and mistress that he had brought the new junior, Xiao Fan, to join them. After sighting the girl who accompanied the master and mistress, Xiao Fan felt scared and quickly sought refuge behind Darren. He exclaimed that she was a demon. In response, Darren reassured Xiao Fan, urging him to calm down and revealing that she was their master, mistress, and senior. Despite Xiao Fan's initial fear, the girl, named Linger, burst into laughter. While she laughed, her mother observed her with a watchful gaze. They took their seats, and the master announced the beginning of their session. Xiao Fan, curious about what was starting, pondered the unfolding situation. Darren leaned in and whispered to Xiao Fan that he should approach the master to show respect and praise. Following Darren's instruction, Xiao Fan swiftly positioned himself in front of the master, lowering repeatedly with speed. Meanwhile, Linger found the scene amusing, breaking into laughter. The mistress intervened, telling Xiao Fan that the respect was sufficient, a grin on her face. Both the mistress and Linger shared a laugh, while the master, considering Xiao Fan foolish, wondered how someone like him could be a disciple on the Great Bamboo Peak. The master stood up, expressing his decision to leave Xiao Fan under Darren's care for the time being. He instructed Darren to teach Xiao Fan the sex rules and the fundamental techniques. Darren acknowledged the master's instructions, and the master left the room. Linger approached Xiao Fan, remarking that they had met again. Xiao Fan, recalling her as the earlier demon, was surprised to find her so cute up close. He thought she was even cuter than Xiao Fang and Ajin from his village. Linger then teasingly informed the other seniors that Xiao Fan was blushing when he looked at her. The mistress intervened, telling Linger not to bully her junior. Linger playfully winked and remarked that finally there was someone younger than her, assuring that she wouldn't bully him. She approached Xiao Fan and instructed him to address her as a senior. Curious, Xiao Fan inquired about the term, and Linger explained that he would have to listen to her from now on. Xiao Fan agreed, saying yes to her request. Observing the situation, the mistress expressed concern to Darren, mentioning that Xiao Fan was still young and might face challenges with the beginner's training. The mistress insisted that Darren would need to offer more assistance to Xiao Fan. Darren agreed, assuring her that he would take care of it. Meanwhile, the other members engaged in conversation, expressing concerns about Xiao Fan's physique and speculating if he could complete the beginner's training. One of them remarked that someone was likely to face difficulties. After hearing this, the mistress became upset, and the others, sensing her anger, became apprehensive. Darren called the mistress who inquired about the reason. Darren explained that the new junior had just joined them, and the master had tasked him with teaching the rules and beginner's training. The mistress acknowledged this, and granted him permission to leave. Once outside, they entered the jungle, where Darren, maintaining a brisk pace, held Xiao Fan's hand. Darren mentioned the need to find a quiet place to impart knowledge about their rules. Linger quickly followed, keeping up with them. After reaching their destination, Darren informed Xiao Fan that they had arrived. Linger, donned in beautiful red attire, joined them. Xiao Fan was captivated by Linger's appearance, finding her stunning. Linger, noticing Xiao Fan's reaction, asked if he found her impressive. Xiao Fan replied, acknowledging Linger's amazing speed, especially when riding that red cloth. Linger remarked that young Junior appeared to be less knowledgeable, questioning how he managed to join the esteemed Bamboo Peak when he couldn't even identify a magical weapon. Upon hearing this, Xiao Fan felt a sense of sadness. He reflected on his earlier life, recalling instances of playing outdoors while his parents urged him to return home promptly for dinner. At that moment, Xiao Fan wished he could have chosen a different path. Darren reassured Xiao Fan, advising him not to dwell on it too much, and emphasizing that he was already part of the community, considering it his new home. Darren went on to share information about a magical item, the Junior Amber Scarlet Sash, which used to be a well-known possession of the mistress in the past. 
He suggested that Xiao Fan need not refer to it simply as the red cloth. In response, Xiao Fan questioned Ling'er's actions, wondering why someone as remarkable as her would pretend to be a demon and use the red cloth to capture him. Linger, with a hint of annoyance, reminded Xiao Fan that Darren had already informed him the correct name was the Amber Scarlet Sash. She warned him that if he uttered the wrong name again, she would not hesitate to confront him. Linger pointed out Xiao Fan's mistake, questioning how he could bring up the topic after getting such unpleasant substances on the magical weapon. This frightened Xiao Fan, prompting him to flee, while Linger playfully chased after him. Observing the scene, Darren remarked that Linger was once again playing a prank on Xiao Fan. Linger expressed that her intention was to build a rapport with her junior, and she hadn't anticipated him being so timid. She jokingly mentioned to Xiao Fan that cleaning his magical weapon had been quite a task, and she hadn't even asked him to compensate for it. Darren whispered to Xiao Fan that there were only two women on their great bamboo peak, one being Xiao Fan senior, and the other their mistress, and he couldn't afford to provoke either of them. Upon hearing the mention of the senior, Linger appeared pleased. Darren informed Xiao Fan that at their great bamboo peak, the newcomers had a daily task of cutting black joint bamboo. He explained that this served as their initial training. Since Xiao Fan was still young, Darren mentioned that for the first three months, he only needed to cut down one bamboo every day, and he was free to choose bamboo of any size. Xiao Fan pondered that the beginner's training seemed to be just about cutting bamboo, wondering why it was perceived as a challenging task by the mistress and senior. Xiao Fan mentioned that he had experience chopping firewood and could fill a basket with it in a day. However, Darren pointed out that Xiao Fan had only cut black joint bamboo. Pondering this, Xiao Fan wondered why the task seemed to be a big deal. Linger intervened, asking Darren why he was in such a rush to bring Xiao Fan far away just to share this information. She added that Darren seemed to have intentionally run away, fearing his mom would scold him. Darren questioned why he would intentionally avoid the mistress's training, and he inquired if Linger was certain that was the way to address his senior, reminding her of the first rule. Darren emphasized the importance of respecting elders, instructing Linger to bear that in mind. Turning to Xiao Fan, he asked if he remembered the rule. Xiao Fan paused to reflect. Subsequently, Darren and Xiao Fan sat on a large stone, while Linger occupied another nearby stone. Darren explained to Xiao Fan about an ancient entity that existed before the birth of heaven and earth, describing it as a solitary and free-spirited being. This entity traveled tirelessly and was deemed worthy to be the mother of heaven and earth. Darren mentioned that they referred to this entity as Tao because its actual name was unknown. If a name were necessary, Darren said, it should be called Greatness. He elaborated that this greatness continually expanded, reaching the farthest points and then returning. As Darren shared these insights with Xiao Fan, Linger was peacefully sleeping nearby. Darren approached Linger and gently woke her up. Linger, upon waking, inquired if they had finished. Darren confirmed that he had imparted all the essential rules that Xiao Fan needed to remember. Linger then approached Xiao Fan and reminded him that he should recite the rules every morning to reinforce them in his memory. She asked if Xiao Fan recalled everything that the senior had just taught him. Xiao Fan pondered for a moment, and after some thought, admitted that he had forgotten everything. Linger chuckled. Mentioning that Senior spent the entire afternoon teaching Xiao Fan, she playfully commented that Xiao Fan seemed a bit slow in catching on. Darren inquired, pointing out that Xiao Fan had been nodding in agreement all along. Xiao Fan responded, admitting that he remembered the teachings at the time, but unfortunately he had forgotten everything by now. Darren decided it was time to return, assuring Xiao Fan that he would gradually teach him again later. They made their way back to the Hall of Serenity. Upon their return, they found their mistress disciplining some other seniors. The mistress questioned Darren about the delay, expressing concern that separate training might be necessary. Darren assured her that he would take the junior back to his lodge first. However, Linger chimed in, offering to assist Darren in downplaying the issue, stating that it was just a small matter. She expressed her desire to spend more time with the junior. Surprised by Linger's statement, Darren was momentarily stunned. Eventually, Linger and Xiao Fan left the hall and went outside. In the meantime, the mistress was reprimanding Darren for the delay. Xiao Fan inquired of Linger whether Darren would be fine now. Linger reassured Xiao Fan, telling him not to worry, mentioning that his mom wouldn't really harm him, and Darren would come through it unharmed. Curious, Xiao Fan asked if the mistress frequently resorted to physical punishment. Linger responded that not at all. Most of the time, his mom was the best. She mentioned that it was nearly time for the Seven Meridians Martial Contest again. She mentioned that Xiao Fan's mom wanted everyone to enhance their skills a bit more before the tournament. Linger explained to him that every 60 years, the Qing Yun sect hosted a significant martial arts competition known as the Seven Meridians Martial Contest. The participants were disciples from the Seven Peaks. Curious, Xiao Fan asked about the Great Bamboo Peak, wondering if they had a strong chance of winning since his mom was powerful. Linger wondered if Xiao Fan was intentionally trying to upset her, stating that he should be aware that their Great Bamboo Peak had experienced a couple of consecutive losses. Xiao Fan admitted he wasn't aware of that. Linger mentioned that Senior Darren was the sole victor in several matches and expressed frustration that seniors from other peaks would mock them, finding it quite annoying. Suddenly Linger turned to Xiao Fan, placing her hands on his shoulders. 
She advised him to train hard, mentioning that the next seven Meridian's martial contests would take place in five years. Linger emphasized that Xiaofan needed to achieve good results for the Great Bamboo Peak. Xiaofan agreed, saying he would give his best. Linger warned him that if he dared to slack off, she would inform his mom, leading to possible repercussions. They resumed walking, and Linger described Xiaofan's mom as nice, but noted her hot temper and strength. She explained that everyone often ended up covered in bruises after training with Xiaofan's mom. Upon reaching their destination, Linger provided directions, informing Xiaofan that he and the other seniors resided in the right wing. She pointed out that his room was at the far end, and then mentioned she had to leave. Linger reminded him to join for dinner in the evening, and emphasized not to forget the morning training session. After Linger left, Xiaofan sat on the stairs, pondering how Jingyu was faring at the moment. He wondered if Jingyu was thinking about him as well. Xiaofan reminded himself that he needed to take care of his own well-being. He admitted he hadn't memorized the rules yet and had training in the morning. Xiaofan committed to doing his best, vowing to impress Senior Darren by skillfully chopping the bamboo during the training session. When Xiaofan went to sleep one night, the next morning as he slowly opened his eyes, he noticed a presence in the room. Curious, he asked Linger if she was trying to spook him again. To his surprise, upon opening his eyes, the first thing he saw was a dog. Startled, Xiaofan questioned Linger about why she had transformed into a dog. Laughing, Linger explained that she had a playful canine companion with her. When Xiaofan took a closer look at her, he felt relieved. Linger mentioned that the sun was already high in the sky and instructed him to get out of bed. She suggested they head to the mountains to chop bamboo. Xiaofan inquired if she was joining them too. Linger affirmed and explained that all disciples from their branch had to engage in black joint bamboo chopping during the initial three years. She mentioned that she had started the task when she was 10 years old and added that this would be Xiaofan's last year for the same. While Xiaofan was contemplating, Linger noticed he was still in bed and directed her dog named Da Huang to hop on him. Da Huang began playfully hitting Xiaofan, who started shouting, resulting in Da Huang tearing Xiaofan's shirt during the playful attack. Comforting Xiaofan, Linger assured him not to worry and mentioned that she would take responsibility for the torn shirt. Xiaofan expressed that the torn shirt was the last one his mom had made for him, and he began crying. Linger advised him not to cry too loudly as the seniors might hear. However, Xiaofan continued to cry loudly. Linger reassured him, repeating her commitment to take responsibility and provide him with another shirt. Despite this, Xiaofan emphasized that the shirt held sentimental value as it was made by his mom. Linger assured Xiaofan that she would mend the torn shirt, offering him the chance to punish her if she failed. She then asked if everything was okay now. Xiaofan questioned if she was serious, to which Linger affirmed. In response, Xiaofan insisted that she accompany him to the temple village. Linger pondered the idea and mentioned that she had heard the village had been abandoned. She asked Xiaofan why he still wanted to go back. Xiaofan explained that he had passed out back then and woke up in Qingyun's sect. He confessed not knowing the whereabouts of his parents' burial and shared that his dog, Da Hei, whom he had grown up with, had insisted that if Xiaofan was dead, then Da Hei should be buried as well. Linger and Xiaofan sat on the floor, and Linger reassured him not to worry, mentioning that his parents and Da Hei were doing well in the other world. Curious, Linger asked why he was so scared of Da Huang when he had a dog back at home. Xiaofan explained that his Da Hei wasn't as big as Da Huang. In a playful manner, Linger then instructed Da Huang to playfully bite Xiaofan again. On the other hand, Xiaofan experienced a nightmare. In his dream, he found himself in front of an isolated house surrounded by a terrifying sky. Inside the house were two individuals, an old man and another magic practitioner named Fiend. Fiend demanded that the old man hand over the blood-devouring orb immediately in exchange for sparing his life. The old man sternly responded, expressing outrage at Fiend's use of a wicked technique that cost people's lives. He declared that he wouldn't let Fiend go that day no matter what. The elderly man in the dream clutched his necklace, breaking it, and selected a small bead from it. Fiend, angered by this act, declared that the old man would meet his end that day. Xiao Fan, shocked by the unfolding scene in his dream, was abruptly awakened. Linger, waking up from her sleep, expressed surprise at Xiao Fan falling asleep there. She noted that he hadn't cut down a single bamboo the entire morning. Taking a dagger, Linger explained to Xiao Fan that she was cutting it for him. Xiao Fan insisted that Linger need not bother and expressed his gratitude. He asserted that the training was his responsibility, and he intended to complete it on his own. In an annoyed tone, Linger questioned whether Xiao Fan knew what time it was. Xiaofan pondered and affirmed that even if it took the entire day, he was committed to finishing it. Linger, still displeased, asked if he ever considered others, emphasizing that if it took him the whole day, he had to stay there until the evening. Linger advised Xiaofan that if he truly wanted to prove himself, he should put in maximum effort from that moment onward. She suggested focusing on completing his training diligently within two hours, instead of engaging in pointless activities. Xiaofan lowered his head, contemplating her words. Linger demonstrated skillfully cutting bamboo with her dagger, leaving Xiaofan amazed. After cutting several pieces of bamboo, Xiaofan selected one, while Linger effortlessly balanced a bundle of bamboo on her shoulder. They then headed back from there. While walking, Xiaofan slipped his hand into his pants pocket and retrieved a bead. 
He examined the stone closely and once again encountered the image of the old man. The old man advised Xiao Fan to keep the bead with him and not let anyone see it. He instructed Xiao Fan that once he had settled down, he should toss it off a cliff and forget about it. Xiao Fan agreed to the old man's instructions. The old man expressed that fate must have brought them together, wondering if he would see Xiao Fan again in the next life. Instructing Xiao Fan, the old man said he had to praise and address him as master. Xiao Fan followed the instructions, thinking about how his parents had passed away suddenly, leaving nothing behind. Despite only briefly meeting Master Pucci, he already felt a connection, as if Master Pucci were a family member to him. Xiao Fan contemplated that the seemingly unattractive bead was the only thing left by Master Pucci, and he was reluctant to discard it. Linger urged Xiao Fan to stop dawdling, reminding him that if they didn't reach the lunch spot in time, they would go hungry. Xiao Fan assured her that he was on his way. Upon arriving at lunch with the others, the master inquired about Xiao Fan's training. Linger chimed in, describing Xiao Fan as clumsy, and explaining that the solo trip to the bamboo forest had completely worn him out. Linger remarked that, in the end, Xiao Fan had only managed to leave a scratch on the bamboo after two hours of cutting. Master promptly ordered everyone to be silent, and all the guys stopped talking. Master then directed them to eat up. Xiao Fan thought that Master had not scolded him at all, and considered Master to be very kind. The other seniors were puzzled by Xiao Fan's statement. After dinner, the other guys left, leaving only Master and Darren behind. Master informed Darren that he would be responsible for everything concerning the seventh junior from that point forward and wouldn't need to report anything to him anymore. Darren respectfully accepted the master's directive. Afterward, the master left the area. Darren then approached Xiao Fan, informing him that they needed to practice after lunch. As Xiao Fan was new there, Darren mentioned that he would teach him the basic Tao techniques. Xiao Fan agreed to Darren's proposal. Darren mentioned there was an important matter he needed to convey to Xiao Fan. He explained that the techniques of their sect were profound and incredible, making them a target for those with malicious intentions. Darren insisted that Xiao Fan must take an oath, vowing never to pass down the techniques to anyone who wasn't a disciple of their sect once he learned them. Xiao Fan solemnly swore that he would never divulge the secret techniques of the Qing Yun sect, pledging under the threat of severe punishment and a gruesome fate. Darren commenced sharing information with Xiao Fan, explaining that the profound Tai Chi techniques formed the basis of all extraordinary skills within the Qing Yun sect. These techniques comprised three stages, Jade Pure Realm, Supreme Pure Realm, and Grand Pure Realm. He mentioned that a significant number of Qing Yun sect disciples, even those who were intelligent and talented, often struggled to advance beyond the Jade Pure Realm in their lifetime. Darren conveyed that even among the cultivators beyond the Jade Pure Realm, they were already quite rare. Regarding the legendary Superior Realm, the Grand Pure Realm, Darren mentioned that it was believed only the unparalleled genius, Grandmaster Qing Ye, had ever attained such a level. Darren explained that reaching level 4 of the Jade Pure Realm signified mastery of the basics, allowing one to begin learning other magical skills and practicing with their own magical weapon. Darren added that in the world, there were various magical weapons, but they all shared a common trait. The material of the weapon determined its power once someone trained with it. He went on to mention that Grandmaster Ching Ye acquired the Ancient Sword, the Celestial Destroyer, at the Illusory Moon Mansion. Darren further explained that their master crafted his own magical sword named Carmine Spirit. Darren mentioned that at the time, he had already reached the fifth level of Jade Pure Realm. Following him was Daji, who had achieved level four, while the other four were still grappling with level three. Darren acknowledged Junior Tianlinger's talent, noting that despite her parents being very young, she managed to reach the fourth level of Jade Pure Realm at the age of 13. He also mentioned that Linger could proficiently use a magical weapon. Xiaofan remarked that Senior Linger was impressive. Darren agreed, stating that she was indeed very intelligent, and they relied on her to enhance their branch's reputation. Holding Xiao Fan's arm, Darren felt compelled to share one last piece of advice. He emphasized that the sex training was designed to be firm and steady, and taking shortcuts to avoid hard work would only lead to disaster. Darren stressed that regardless of how far one could go in life, it was all a part of their fate. Darren advised Xiao Fan not to become fixated on things that were not destined for him. He drew a parallel with the heretic ways of wicked individuals, cautioning that although they might gain power quickly, most of them would face divine retribution in the end, deeming them despicable and pathetic. Darren emphasized the importance of being cautious. Xiao Fan acknowledged this advice, saying yes and expressing his understanding of the guidance. Darren expressed approval, saying good to Xiao Fan. He suggested calling it a day and mentioned that he needed to learn the mantra. Darren explained that he memorized it by heart and trained himself accordingly, expressing confidence that he would soon master the basics. Xiao Fan thanked Darren for his guidance. Grinning, Darren left the area. After Darren departed, Xiao Fan entered, removed his shoes, and sat on the floor in a yoga position. As Xiao Fan contemplated the mantra the seniors had taught him, he suddenly found himself saying that it didn't make sense. Xiao Fan experimented with various positions for the mantras, repeatedly expressing that none of them made sense to him. As he pondered, Xiao Fan recalled Darren's explanation about the profound Tai Chi technique. 
emphasizing the absorption of natural energy into the body and its circulation to harmonize with the heavens and earth. Perplexed, Xiaofan wondered why this contradicted the mantra Master Pucci had taught him. He was certain that Master Pucci had instructed him to sever all connections with the outside world while cultivating and refining his magical weapon. With a confused mood, Xiaofan remarked that Master Pucci hadn't mentioned such a situation before. Deciding to train both techniques simultaneously, he returned to his bed and earnestly practiced the mantra. Three years later, Xiaofan found himself in the jungle, cutting bamboo. Suddenly a pine cone struck him on the head. Wondering if it was Senior Linger, he called out, but no one appeared. Xiaofan insisted that she reveal herself since he had already seen her. Once again, a pine cone struck Xiaofan's head. Upon investigation, he discovered a monkey perched on the bamboo, holding a pine cone. Stunned by the unexpected sight, Xiaofan questioned why there was a monkey in the bamboo forest. The mischievous monkey resumed throwing pine cones at him, but Xiaofan skillfully dodged the projectiles, playfully commenting that the monkey had missed its target. Xiaofan declared that he was ignoring the monkey. Suddenly the mischievous creature threw two pine cones at Xiaofan, causing him to lose his balance and fall. The monkey laughed at the spectacle, but Xiaofan dismissed it as foolish. Determined to retaliate, Xiaofan unsheathed his sword, vowing to make the monkey pay for its antics. He began cutting the bamboo swiftly, but the nimble monkey outran him, evading Xiaofan's pursuit. After some time, Xiaofan halted, exhausted, and challenged the monkeys to come down. The mischievous monkey continued to laugh and then pulled out several pine cones. Xiaofan, startled by the sight, watched as the monkey threw the pine cones at him. Later, when Xiaofan returned, Linger inquired about what happened to his head. Xiaofan explained that he had been tricked by a monkey. After hearing about Xiaofan's encounter with the monkeys, Linger burst into laughter. She mentioned that Xiaofan's mom had advised her to spend more time training at Tai Chi Kev in preparation for the upcoming tournaments in two years. Linger expressed surprise that Xiaofan had been bullied by a monkey, reassuring him not to worry. She added that she would accompany him to the mountains the next day to teach the mischievous monkey a lesson. Reassuring Xiaofan, Linger stated that as long as she was present, no one could get away with bullying him. Xiaofan was shocked by Linger's reaction. The following day, they arrived at the bamboo jungle. Linger instructed Xiaofan to enter the forest alone initially, with her following him afterward. Xiaofan agreed, entering the jungle with the expectation that the mischievous monkeys would face consequences that day. As Xiaofan looked back, he noticed that Linger was nowhere to be seen, realizing that she must have moved quickly. Upon reaching the jungle and gazing at the bamboo trees, Xiaofan thought the mischievous monkey might be too scared to appear, knowing he had assistance that day. Suddenly, the monkey threw another pine cone at Xiaofan, hitting him on the head. Xiaofan remarked that the monkey had shown up. Just then, Linger arrived with her magical red cloth and struck the monkey. As Linger struck the monkey, it tumbled down, prompting her to remark that the little creature had managed to escape. Xiaofan, eager to catch the monkey, began running but suddenly encountered a large hole in his path. Linger warned him to watch out for the hole, and Xiaofan quickly halted. Informing Linger that the monkey had fallen into the hole, she instructed him to hop onto her red cloth. Linger took Xiaofan's hand and pulled him onto her magical red cloth. As Xiaofan found himself up in the air, he felt scared. Linger advised him to hold onto her tightly. When Xiaofan questioned how to do it, Linger simply told him to shut his mouth and hold on. Xiaofan followed her instructions, finding the cloth surprisingly soft. Linger reminded him to hold tight as they began flying and entered the hole. In the depths of the valley, they found themselves in a hole. Linger noticed a monkey there and quickly informed Xiaofan. Spotting the monkey, Linger rushed towards it. However, Xiaofan began to feel dizzy, wondering why this was happening to him. Suddenly, Linger's magical cloth lost its power in that place, causing both Linger and Xiaofan to fall to the ground. Xiaofan's orb dropped close to him, and he noticed a warm sensation emanating from it, significantly improving his well-being. The pain from the fall seemed to lessen considerably. Concerned, he glanced at Linger and inquired about her well-being, asking if she was all right. Xiaofan gently lifted Linger, placing her in a seated position. He thought she had merely fainted. Carrying her, Xiaofan realized she was quite heavy as they made their way to join the others under the tree. Xiaofan found it odd. The queasiness he felt disappeared once they left the clearing. Suddenly he noticed the monkey on the ground, appearing weak and feeble. Wondering why the monkey seemed so feeble, Xiaofan decided to stand up and approach it. As he got closer, the environment made him cough. Despite the challenging conditions, he picked up the monkey and returned to the shade of the tree. Xiaofan, still coughing, glanced at his orb and remarked that it had likely saved his life just moments ago. He placed the orb back around his neck and turned his attention to Linger. Xiaofan's conscience urged him to act quickly and make the most of the moment with Linger. However, another part of his conscience questioned his thoughts, wondering how he could consider taking advantage of her. Xiaofan firmly decided against such actions, stating that he couldn't do that to her. Meanwhile, the monkey observed him. Suddenly, Xiaofan noticed a peculiar weapon embedded in the ground, prompting him to wonder about its presence. Opening his orb and observing its activity, he couldn't comprehend what was happening. Puzzled, he resumed his mantra practice. When Xiaofan glanced at his orb once more, it illuminated again. 
Suddenly, magic started occurring with the orb, leading him to believe that the bead could absorb people's life energy. Holding the orb in his hand, he experienced intense pain. The monkey observed him closely. Subsequently, magical rays emanated from the orb towards the weapon embedded in the ground. Xiao Fan began vomiting blood as his orb generated excessive power. The weapon, previously embedded in the ground, was forcefully pulled out and swiftly collided with his orb locket. Upon contact, Xiao Fan involuntarily leaped into the air before collapsing unconscious on the ground, still clutching the weapon in his hand. After some time, they both returned home, and Linger informed her father of their arrival. The master questioned their whereabouts, noting they had been gone since morning. Linger, with a grin, explained to her father that Xiao Fan had been bullied by a monkey while chopping bamboo. In response, she went to the scene and caught the monkey for him. The monkey accompanied them back to the house. Linger explained that when they pursued it into the valley, she suddenly felt nauseated and passed out. Upon waking up, she found Xiao Fan lying unconscious on the ground. Fortunately, neither of them sustained any injuries. Linger mentioned that the monkey seemed particularly fond of Xiao Fan and refused to let go of him on their way back. Consequently, they brought the monkey back with them as well. The master inquired of the mistress about Linger's explanation. The mistress responded, stating that she had already examined the area when she went in search of them and found nothing unusual. She mentioned attributing it to Linger's insufficient cultivation, but admitted to taking Xiao Fan for a flight, ultimately exhausting herself in the process. Linger questioned her about what she meant, asking how her cultivation could be deemed insufficient. Turning to Xiao Fan, Linger sought clarification on the matter. Xiao Fan affirmed Linger's words, acknowledging their accuracy. The master addressed Xiao Fan, expressing disbelief that, as a disciple of the Qingyun sect, he could be bullied by a monkey. He emphasized the potential embarrassment if such information were to spread. The mistress remarked that she hadn't eaten all day, acknowledging their likely hunger. Linger expressed her hunger, confirming the sentiment. Xiao Fan observed that the master seemed unwilling to address him. Subsequently, Xiao Fan returned to his room. The monkey leaped down and began playing in the room. Xiao Fan thought the monkey was rather foolish, but adept at making itself comfortable. They both took a seat on Xiao Fan's bed, and Xiao Fan retrieved the stick, examining it with confusion. Wondering about the purpose of the unattractive stick, he questioned why he had even brought it back. Xiao Fan tossed the stick into a corner, with the monkey observing the action. Eventually, Xiao Fan settled down to sleep, and the monkey watched him attentively. The next morning, Xiao Fan was busy cooking. Reflecting on the past six months since Sixth Senior, Du Bishu left the mountain to gather materials for his magical weapon, Xiao Fan realized he had taken on the responsibility of cooking. Although his culinary skills weren't exceptional, everyone seemed satisfied with the meals he prepared. Suddenly Xiao Fan heard a noise and wondered about the source of the sound. Emerging outside with the monkey and Da Huang, Xiao Fan noticed two individuals landing nearby through flight. As he observed them, Xiao Fan recognized one of the boys, Jing Yu. The reunion brought them great joy. The other guys introduced themselves as disciples from the Dragonhead Peak, followers of Paragon Chang Song and Qi Hao. Jing Yu conveyed his greetings to the master, mentioning his name in the process. Xiao Fan observed that Jing Yu had also grown up, and they exchanged glances. The master inquired about the reason for their visit, and the guy explained that sect master Paragon Daoxuan had assigned their master, Paragon Changsong, to handle the affairs of the tournament two years later. Due to some minor changes, he directed junior Jing Yu to come and provide the necessary information. The master remarked that their master, Paragon Changsong, intentionally did it to show off. The guy addressed him as Master Tian. Acknowledging his great sense of humor and expressing respect, clarifying that their master didn't mean any disrespect. The mistress reassured him, telling him not to take the master's words seriously, as he was just joking. She inquired about the mentioned change, asking for details. The guy explained that in the previous Qingyun tournaments, each branch of the Qingyun sect would send four disciples as representatives. Additionally, the main branch, Shy Reaching Peak, would send four more, resulting in a total of 32 contestants. He mentioned that they used to draw straws to determine the order of the tournament. The mistress mentioned that he was quite the star of the show in the last competition, recalling that he ultimately secured second place. She speculated that if it weren't for Xiao Yikai from the main branch, he might have won first place. The guy addressed the mistress by the name of Su, suggesting she was flattering him. He continued, stating that after their master and the sect master discussed the next tournament, they decided to implement some changes in the rules. Su and Tian inquired about what he meant. The guy explained that their master, Chang Song Paragon, believed that the tournament's purpose was to showcase talents from all peaks. Given the nearly a thousand disciples in the Qingyun sect, having only four competitors for each peak seemed insufficient. Consequently, their master proposed that each of the seven branches should send nine disciples, while the main branch would send one more, totaling 64 contestants. He clarified that everything else about the tournament would remain the same. Master Tian considered that while it might appear that all the disciples of the Great Bamboo Peak could participate, the change actually favored other peaks with more gifted disciples. He perceived it as a cunning move. Master Tian expressed approval, stating he had no objections. The guy added that their master also requested another favor. Since his junior was an old friend of Master Tian's disciple, he hoped that Master Tian would allow them to have a chat. 
The guy informed Darren that they had met during the last competition. Jing Yu then suggested to Xiao Fan that they go outside. Darren complimented the guy's good memory, noting that he even remembered the opponent he had defeated. Linger asked Mistress Su how senior Darren lost to him. Darren explained to the guy that last time he had secured two consecutive wins, and both he and his dad were delighted. However, unexpectedly, he faced this guy in his third match and lost after a few rounds. The guy commented that this meant he was truly strong. Master Tian agreed, acknowledging that Chi Hao was significantly more gifted than Darren, and that the match was entirely fair. He highlighted the exceptional quality of the magical ice sword that Chi Hao had refined, crafted from a 10,000-year-old ice crystal. According to Master Tian, the sword was exceptionally powerful, leaving his senior with no chance of victory. Linger was lost in thought when the guy inquired if she was the renowned Tian Linger, Junior Tian. Startled, Linger asked how he knew about her. The guy explained that her proficiency in the profound Tai Chi technique at the age of 16 had already gained widespread recognition within the sect. He mentioned that everyone admired her abilities. He mentioned that even though he hadn't seen her in person today, he was certain that what he had heard about her was accurate. Linger questioned how he could judge her skills without witnessing her fight. The guy responded by praising her not only for her beauty, but also for her quick-wittedness. He expressed humility in acknowledging her as his senior. Linger continued to gaze at the guy. The guy mentioned that in terms of talent, there was someone who could compete with Linger. Curious, Linger asked who it was. The guy revealed he was referring to his junior, Jing Yu, acknowledging him as truly gifted. He shared that their master had described Jing Yu as a genius who only appeared once in a millennium. Master Tian gripped his chair tightly, causing Linger to be slightly startled. The guy inquired if he had said something wrong. Suddenly, Xiao Fan was struck from outside, tumbling onto the floor in the presence of everyone. Witnessing this, Linger became shocked and concerned for him. Jing Yu rushed in from outside, expressing concern for Xiao Fan and apologizing to him. Xiao Fan assured everyone that he was okay. Linger, angered by the incident, questioned who the person thought they were to bully him like that. Expressing her frustration, Linger activated her red cloth magic. Jing Yu, witnessing Linger's response, also became upset and unleashed his own magic, letting out a roar. Concerned about the situation, the guy who arrived with Jing Yu and Mistress Su instructed them to cease their actions. Jing Yu ascended into the air with the aid of his magic, leaving Xiao Fan impressed by Jing Yu's strength. Master Tian mentioned that he had indeed passed down the sword Dragon Slayer to Jing Yu. The guy added that their master had once stated Jing Yu's talent was extraordinary, predicting that he would undoubtedly become someone great. Understanding the importance of nurturing Jing Yu's talent, everyone was determined to do their best. In response, Linger hurled her red cloth sashes toward Jing Yu, creating swirling circles around him. Mr. Su urged Linger to stop. Xiao Fan, surprised by the display, watched in awe. The guy explained that it was an amber scarlet sash, living up to its name. Jing Yu swiftly broke free from the red sash and advanced toward Linger with great speed. The onlookers were shocked, thinking that Jing Yu intended to harm Linger. However, as Jing Yu approached, Master Tian swiftly hurled his dragon sword into the center, creating an ice wall that separated them. The guy restrained Jing Yu from advancing further, while Mistress Su held Linger back from retaliating. Master Tian complimented the skill, acknowledging it as a well-executed murder attempt. The guy quietly instructed Jing Yu to apologize for his mistake. Jing Yu turned to Xiao Fan and apologized for his earlier actions, admitting that they had agreed to test each other's skills, but he shouldn't have gone too far. Xiao Fan reassured him, stating that it was no problem and everything was fine. However, upon witnessing this, Master Tian became angry and moved to strike Xiao Fan. Mistress Su restrained Master Tian, reminding him of his seniority and questioning how he could get angry at a junior like Xiao Fan. The guy requested forgiveness, emphasizing that, for the sake of their master, Master Tian shouldn't be too harsh on juniors like them. Xiao Fan took responsibility, admitting that it was his fault for wanting to assess Jing Yu's skills when he saw him riding on the sword. That's how it all began, and Xiao Fan once again took the blame, admitting it was his fault. Master Tian told him to shut his mouth and suddenly struck Xiao Fan, causing him to fall down and vomit blood. Worried about Xiao Fan, Linger approached and asked if he was all right. Observing this, Jing Yu became angry with Master Tian, calling him Short Fatso and questioning his actions. The mention of Short Fatso further enraged Master Tian. Quickly, Master Tian ascended into the air and approached Jing Yu with the intent to strike him. The guy advised Jing Yu to take care of himself. In response, Jing Yu created a magic circle around himself. Master Tian swiftly closed in on Jing Yu, skillfully pinching the magic circle and promptly inserting his dragon sword inside. Jing Yu was left stunned by this maneuver. The guy remarked that Master Tian had shown mercy to both of them. Suddenly, the guy positioned himself in front of Jing Yu. Master Tian remarked that while the Dragon Slayer sword might be one of the nine divine weapons, it wasn't necessarily invincible. Master Tian moved his dragon sword, generating a new magic. Witnessing this magic, Jing Yu was shocked as it created a defensive wall in front of them. When Master Tian threw his sword towards them, the Dragon Slayer sword shattered the defending wall upon impact. Subsequently, the dragon sword embedded itself on the floor. The guy expressed gratitude to Master Tian for sparing them both. Jing Yu, still shocked, was visibly sweating. Master Tian stated that they could leave for now. The guy confirmed they were departing and instructed Jing Yu to go with them. 
they mounted their swords and began flying back. Xiao Fan felt a sense of sadness as Jing Yu left. The next day, Xiao Fan was working with fire and a stick, reflecting on the previous night when Linger had called him for something. He went to the location where Linger had called him. Xiao Fan inquired why she had summoned him there. Linger responded by asking him to come closer, mentioning she had something good for him. Linger showed him a certain type of paper, and Xiao Fan inquired about its purpose. Upon seeing the paper, he was astonished and exclaimed loudly that it was the mantra for level 3. Linger cautioned him not to be loud, affirming that she was indeed passing it down to him. She acknowledged that she knew his dad had always looked down on him, advising him to take the mantra and practice it secretly on his own. She assured him that one day, he would prove himself to his dad and wouldn't face humiliation like today. Xiao Fan expressed concern about master and mistress finding out and wondered if they would scold Linger. Linger dismissed it, stating they would just lecture her and perhaps ground her for a few days, considering it as nothing significant. She emphasized that she couldn't bear to see him push to hopelessness and advised him not to become too emotional about it. Xiao Fan believed that Linger had always taken care of him, and he was determined to protect her even if it meant putting his life at risk. Linger advised him to remember one crucial thing, he needed to work harder. She encouraged him to strive to become as strong as the arrogant person they knew. Xiao Fan expressed his joy and promised to put in the effort to achieve his goal. Linger mentioned that no matter how diligently Xiao Fan worked, he would never reach the level of senior Qi Hao. She advised him to let go of that idea. As Linger moved away, Xiao Fan continued to gaze at the mantra, forgetting what he was doing with the fire. In that moment of distraction, he accidentally placed his hand in the fire and quickly pulled it back. Reflecting on Linger's words, Xiao Fan considered her straightforward advice that no matter how much effort he put in, he could never match senior Qi Hao. Although initially upset, Xiao Fan realized that Linger was merely speaking the truth. At that time, all his seniors were engrossed in secluded training, gearing up for upcoming tournaments. Xiao Fan felt like the odd one out, spending his time cooking mundane meals and being accompanied by two pets. While Monkey and the dog were playing, Xiao Fan grew irritated and asked them to stop, even calling the monkey stupid. After a considerable time, Bishu finally appeared, surprising Xiao Fan. Overjoyed, Xiao Fan remarked that Bishu had been gone for only a few years, yet he had already grown as tall as him. Curious, Xiao Fan inquired about the reason for Bishu's long absence and expressed how much they all missed him. Bishu too was happy to reunite with them. When Xiao Fan asked about the magical weapon Bishu had created during his journey, Bishu teased that Xiao Fan would find out soon enough. A while later, they all gathered around the dining table. Darren inquired about how Bishu managed to upset the master right after returning. Linger questioned her father, asking why senior Bishu had incurred the master's anger upon his return. Master Tian explained that it was because Bishu hadn't shown them his magical weapon. Mistress Su advised Bishu to reveal it, assuring him that it would help them understand why the master was so upset. Bishu, feeling uneasy and sweating, agreed to show them his creation. Bishu then opened his pot and placed some dice on the table. After seeing the dice, everyone was shocked and burst into laughter. Master expressed his disappointment, calling Bishu hopeless. Mistress Su, however, tried to lighten the situation, mentioning that it wasn't that serious, even if his magical weapon turned out to be a set of dice. She suggested that Bishu could be the one to use them. Master raised concerns, questioning how they could trust Bishu not to use the dice for dishonest purposes. In response, Bishu solemnly swore that he would never engage in such shameless activities. Master expressed his frustration, stating that he wouldn't have minded if Bishu had chosen any other item as his weapon. However, now that he had a set of gambling items, Master Tian voiced concerns about potential embarrassment if Bishu used them during the tournament. He reminded Bishu that this was something he loved, emphasizing that he hadn't forced him to make this choice. Master Tian then questioned if Bishu still remembered Senior Wan. Tian was taken aback by Bishu's reaction to this revelation. Mistress Su reminded Bishu that both she and his master had never compelled him to use swords like disciples from other branches. However, she stressed the significance of one's magical weapon and advised Bishu to handle it with care. Mistress Su mentioned that the Qingyun tournament was only a month away, and it was time for all of them to head to the main branch at Sky Reaching Peak. She encouraged Bishu to get prepared for the upcoming event. Mistress Su urged Bishu not to disappoint his master and her again this time. Just then, Xiao Fan called out to Mistress Su, prompting her to inquire about the reason. Xiao Fan asked if he could join as well, to which Mistress Su responded affirmatively, reminding him that he was also a disciple of the Great Bamboo Peak. Xiao Fan expressed his gratitude, and both he and Bishu were delighted. As Master Tian departed, he remarked that they had nine slots available, even if they included one for Xiao Fan, but adding one for an incompetent person would be a waste. Xiao Fan, along with the dog and the monkey, returned to the scene. Xiao Fan noticed a stick lying nearby and approached it. He commanded the stick to move upwards, expressing skepticism about someone like him being able to use object-controlling magic. However, to his surprise, the stick moved upward, and Xiao Fan quickly grabbed it. Excited by the magical feat, Xiao Fan happily exclaimed to Da Huang that the stick had actually moved. Da Huang and the monkey observed as Xiao Fan joyfully leaped around. Later, Xiao Fan went outside and joined Linger under a tree. 
Concerned, Linger asked him what was bothering him. Xiao Fan assured her that it was nothing, and then revealed the stick he had used earlier. Curious, Linger inquired why he was carrying the fire poker with him. Xiao Fan explained that the master had graciously allowed him to participate, despite his limited cultivation and lack of a magical weapon. Linger chuckled and remarked that she understood. He intended to use his fire poker in the tournaments. She found it amusing, considering the already unusual history of Senior Bishu's magical dice spanning 2,000 years within the Qingyun sect. Linger expressed surprise at Xiao Fan bringing a fire poker, finding the idea unexpectedly humorous. She continued to laugh, finding the situation quite entertaining. They all traveled towards the sky-reaching peak on their swords, with Xiao Fan seated on Darren's sword. Darren instructed his fellow juniors to hold on tight as they prepared to land. Upon reaching the sky peak, Xiao Fan expressed his joy at being there again. As he looked around, he observed the multitude of people present, remarking on the considerable crowd. Darren noticed an increasing number of disciples joining the Qingyun sect. Suddenly, Linger arrived and called out to Darren, informing him of their presence. Xiao Fan, accompanied by a monkey, looked around with joy upon seeing Linger. Linger inquired about Xiao Fan's impression of the journey's scenery, to which Xiao Fan happily replied that it was truly breathtaking. Linger encouraged Xiao Fan, stating that he needed to work hard. She mentioned that once he obtained his magical weapon, he could freely fly around and enjoy the scenery. Xiao Fan expressed his determination to achieve this goal. Darren inquired with his junior Daji about the whereabouts of their master and mistress. Daji explained that they had arrived with their master and mistress, and the welcoming seniors from the main branch had guided them to the Yuching Temple up there. He mentioned that an announcement was made instructing the chiefs of the seven branches to assemble and discuss the tournament details. The master had requested them to wait there. Darren quietly asked Daji if he had observed the presence of numerous unfamiliar disciples from other branches. He noted that they had arrived earlier and inquired if they had received any information. Daji responded, expressing a similar sense of uncertainty. It appeared that the other branches had recruited a significant number of new disciples in recent years. Junior Daji observed that there were indeed many fresh faces, but he believed that the contestants in the upcoming tournament would mostly be the seniors with higher cultivation. He explained that seniors, being more experienced, were likely to dominate the competition. Darren suggested that things might be different and asked if the juniors recalled the young disciple Lin Jingyu, sent by Dragonhead Peak. All the juniors lowered their heads, and Linger commented that he wasn't anything exceptional. Xiao Fan was surprised, and Linger added that it was okay if he chose not to participate in the tournament. However, if he did, she expressed a desire to be matched against him, continuing their unresolved fight from before. Suddenly a girl named Wen Min called out to Darren, leaving him stunned. He remarked that it had been quite a while. Darren's joy was evident upon seeing her, and all his juniors burst into laughter. Shortly after, another guy named Chi Hao arrived with his companions. One junior commented on the abundance of people from Dragonhead Peak. Chi approached Darren and mentioned that they had crossed paths again. Darren addressed him as Senior Chi and expressed his surprise at Chi's presence there. Darren wondered if Chi would participate in the tournament. Chi explained that he hadn't planned to originally, but their master insisted he needed more training and ordered him to join. So he had to shamelessly take one of their branch's slots. Darren expressed his approval, stating that with Senior Chi's abilities, he would undoubtedly secure the first place position this time. Chi modestly responded, grinning at the praise. Suddenly, Jing Yu approached Xiao Fan and inquired whether he intended to participate in the tournament. Xiao Fan replied affirmatively, mentioning that the master had been very kind and allowed him to participate. He then asked Jing Yu if he was joining as well. Jing Yu confirmed his participation, expressing his lack of admiration for their master. He recalled an incident from two years ago when their master treated him poorly during a visit. Xiao Fan defended their master, stating that he wasn't like that most of the time, and explained that he was just furious on that particular day. Jing Yu remarked that it had been a while since he last saw Xiao Fan, and noted that he had already grown quite tall. Another junior jokingly asked if Xiao Fan was the only one allowed to grow taller, prompting laughter from Xiao Fan. Qi greeted Linger, saying that they had met again. Xiao Fan, while looking towards Qi, was asked by Jing Yu what was wrong. Xiao Fan replied nothing to him. Qi asked Linger if she still remembered him. Linger replied affirmatively, expressing that it was nice to see him again, Soon after, a guy arrived on a sword and informed everyone that, by the order of the sect master and the chiefs, all contestants of the Qing Yun tournament were to enter Yuqing Hall to listen to the speech. All the individuals began heading inside the hall, and the junior members of Bamboo Peak were going in alongside Qi. Xiao Fan looked sad as he observed Qi going inside. Jing Yu remarked that senior Qi was skilled at making friends. He added that not to mention Qi had a high level of cultivation, and Master Chang Song had a lot of faith in him. Jing Yu mentioned that everyone in the Qing Yun sect held great respect for Qi. As all the individuals walked toward the hall, Xiao Fan asked Jing Yu why no one was using their swords to fly. Jing Yu explained that disciples like them weren't permitted to fly near the main hall of Sky Reaching Peak. He shared that he had heard from Senior Chi Hao that as a sign of respect to the main branch, they needed to ascend the stairs in the sacred ground of Yuqing Temple. Jing Yu added that he had also heard about an extremely powerful sword formation called the Celestial Destroyer, positioned at the top of Sky Reaching Peak. 
It was set up to protect the area. Jing Yu explained that if anyone flew above sky reaching peak without permission, they would be eliminated by the celestial destroyer sword formation. Xiao Fan remarked that it made sense why none of the powerful disciples were flying and asked if the celestial destroyer sword formation was formidable. Jing Yu replied that he had never seen it, but believed it must be very powerful. He explained that the sword formation was said to be passed down by Grandmaster Ching Yun, and a thousand years later, Grandmaster Ching Ye perfected it. With its extraordinary capabilities, no one had dared to challenge Ching Yun Mountain since then. Xiao Fan gazed toward the mountain and expressed amazement. As they walked on the bridge where the water dragon appeared, they all lowered down in respect. Jing Yu then asked Xiao Fan if he remembered their first arrival. Xiao Fan affirmed, stating that they were completely soaked, and he felt terrified upon seeing such a huge monster. Jing Yu chuckled, mentioning that back in the temple village they had never come across anything nearly as massive. At one point, he used to believe that the bear on Ching Yun Mountain was the largest animal in the world. Xiao Fan burst into laughter, and the others quickly told him to hush. Xiao Fan placed his hand over his mouth, and both he and Jing Yu grinned. Jing Yu inquired of Xiao Fan whether there was a magical weapon he desired to create. Xiao Fan responded negatively, explaining that his cultivation wasn't sufficient for him to control a magical weapon at that point. Jing Yu reassured him, stating that with hard work, he would eventually succeed. Jing Yu added that they were still young, encouraging them to simply enjoy the atmosphere at the moment. Curious about enjoying the atmosphere, Xiao Fan suddenly witnessed the water monster known as Spirit Immortal emerging from the water with a thunderous roar. All the guys, including Xiao Fan and Jing Yu, were taken aback and frightened by the unexpected appearance of Spirit Immortal. They wondered anxiously about the sudden presence of the Spirit Immortal and what it might entail. Perplexed by the unfolding events, Wen and Qi directed their attention towards the Spirit Immortal. In a surprising turn of events, the Sekmaster arrived and leaped onto the Spirit Immortal. Xiao Fan and Jing Yu were astonished to see the Sekmaster there. When the Spirit Immortal attempted to strike them, the Sekmaster swiftly conjured a defensive magic to protect everyone. However, the force of the magic caused all the individuals present to tumble to the ground. A wave of shock swept through the group as the Sect Master and other seniors approached the Spirit Immortal. Turning around, the Spirit Immortal retreated from the scene. Xiao Fan remarked that it was fortunate no one had been hurt, and Jing Yu credited the Sect Master for the successful outcome. As everyone headed indoors, Xiao Fan called out to Jing Yu. Jing Yu inquired about the reason for the inquiry. Xiao Fan explained that something had crossed his mind, and he asked if Jing Yu had seen Uncle Wang in recent years. Jing Yu responded negatively, mentioning that it was his first visit back to Sky Reaching Peak today as well. Jing Yu went on to share that three years earlier, he had inquired with Senior Chi Hao about Uncle Wang's well being. According to Chi Hao, Uncle Wang was still behaving erratically. Jing Yu noted that currently, Uncle Wang spent his days running around Sky Reaching Peak, but reassured Xiao Fan that seniors were keeping an eye on him, ensuring his safety. Xiao Fan expressed his desire to visit Uncle Wang once the tournament concluded. He asked Jing Yu if he would join him, to which Jing Yu agreed, mentioning he'd also like to pay Uncle Wang a visit. Just as they were discussing this, the sect master descended, and a person named Master Kang Song attempted to convey something about the spirit immortal. The sect master intervened, preventing Master Kang Song from speaking. The sect master then inquired if everyone was present, expressing satisfaction upon confirmation. The assembled individuals extended their greetings to the sect master. Master Kang Song then shared a piece of wisdom, referring to an ancient sage who emphasized the value of diligence and hard work. He also mentioned an idiom likening progress to rowing a boat upstream, emphasizing the importance of continuous effort. Master Kang Song explained that to inspire the younger generations, their late grandmasters had established the significant event known as the Seven Meridians Martial Arts Contest. He noted that the ongoing tournament marked the 20th edition of this event. Jing Yu remarked that if the tournament occurred every 60 years, then it must have been ongoing for 1,200 years. Xiao Fan expressed amazement at the longevity of the tradition. Master Kang Song noted that the Qing Yun sect was thriving more than ever today, surpassing the prosperity of the past. As a result, after discussions with the chiefs and sect master, they decided to elevate the number of contestants to 64, aiming to provide opportunities to more talents. Kang Song explained that for this tournament, they were doubling the usual number of contestants. Consequently, the drawing process would be slightly different this time. Kang Song presented a box to everyone, explaining that inside the red box were 63 pills, each containing a note with a number from 1 to 63. He clarified that the drawing would determine the match order, with contestants facing off based on the drawn numbers, such as 1 against 64, 2 against 63, 3 against 62, and so forth. Kang Song outlined the structure for the subsequent rounds, explaining that in the second round, the victor of the match between number 1 and 64 would face the winner of number 2 and 63. This pattern would continue until the final round. After providing the instructions, Kang Song asked if everyone comprehended the format. Suddenly, a participant raised a question, inquiring why there were only 63 wax pills if there were 64 contestants. Kang Song clarified that each branch of the Qingyun sect would be sending nine disciples to the tournament, 
while the main branch would contribute 10, accounting for a total of 64 contestants. Kang Song explained that due to a branch being able to send only 8 disciples, there was one less participant, making the total number 63. As everyone exchanged glances, Kang Song reassured them that the discrepancy wouldn't pose an issue. He mentioned that among the 63 wax pills, the person who drew number 1 would be the luckiest, as there was no 64th contestant. Consequently, the individual drawing number 1 would automatically advance to the next round without having to compete. The group found the situation interesting, and Kang Song announced that it was time to commence the drawing. Each person took their turn drawing. Jing Yu reminded Xiao Fan that it was his turn, and Xiao Fan acknowledged him. While drawing, Xiao Fan reflected that Taoist Kang Song and Taoist Shang Zhengliang were the same elders he had encountered five years ago. Observing the scene, Xiao Fan thought that Taoist Kang Song and Taoist Shang Zhengliang hadn't changed a bit. He noticed a girl he hadn't seen before, and speculated that she must be the chief of Minor Bamboo Peak, named Master Shui Yue. Considering Wen, Xiao Fan recognized her as the girl he had seen earlier. When Xiao Fan attempted to approach for a closer look, Linger held his arm and reminded him that it was their turn to draw, advising him not to space out. Xiao Fan grinned and nodded in acknowledgement to Linger. The group engaged in conversation, sharing their drawn numbers. One person mentioned having drawn number 26, another stated they were assigned number 47, and someone else revealed they were number 33. They asked each other about their respective numbers, and one person expressed curiosity about their opponent's assigned number. Following the discussions, Kang Song inquired about the person who had drawn number one. The group exchanged glances, and then a voice spoke up. A guy announced that he had drawn number one, revealing it was actually Xiao Fan who had secured that position. The group, including Master Tian and Mistress Su, was shocked to discover that Xiao Fan had drawn number one. While the others expressed surprise, Mistress Su couldn't help but grin. One guy in a humorous tone commented on Xiao Fan's luck in getting number one, to which Xiao Fan responded with a smile. Bishu, in a loud voice, remarked that he should have placed a bet on who would draw number one, confident that he would have won big. Linger quickly told the guy to hush. In a polite manner, she informed Xiao Fan that he wouldn't stand a chance, even if he made it to the second round. Linger suggested the idea of Xiao Fan giving her his number. Xiao Fan was ready to comply, but suddenly Darren intervened, telling Linger to stop teasing. Linger then clarified to Xiao Fan that she was just joking. Xiao Fan smiled as Kang Song announced the completion of the draw. Kang Song then instructed everyone to come forward and register their names along with their assigned numbers. He mentioned that a list would be posted later to reveal the matchups. Additionally, Kang Song informed them of an encouraging development. The chiefs had decided that beginning with this tournament, the ultimate winner would receive a small prize as a reward for their hard work. Joyful expressions filled the room as Kang Song revealed that the prize for the tournament would be the Liuhi Mirror. The mention of the mirror prompted everyone to contemplate its significance. Curious, Linger turned to Darren and inquired about the Liuhi Mirror. Darren explained that it was the magical weapon of their sect's 10th Grandmaster Paragon, Wu Fengzi. He admitted not having seen it, so he couldn't describe its appearance. Darren shared that he had heard about the Liuhe Mirror from the Master, considering it one of the best treasures of their sect due to its extraordinary power. According to Darren, the mirror possessed a special ability. As long as its user had sufficient energy, the Liuhe Mirror could reflect all attacks without fail. Bishu wondered if this made it invincible, and Darren admitted that he wasn't entirely sure. He emphasized that what the Master had told him must be true. Darren remarked that it seemed like the Chiefs had indeed put a significant effort into organizing the tournament. At that moment, the Sect Master arrived and assured everyone that everything was in order. He instructed them to return and rest, announcing that the tournament would officially commence the next morning. The group readily agreed, saying okay to the Sect Master. As they made their way back, the seven elders were seated there. The Sect Master informed the group that now only the seven of them remained, and he had just checked on Spirit Immortal. A guy inquired if the Sect Master had discovered what was wrong with Spirit Immortal earlier. The Sect Master responded that he had examined Spirit Immortal closely, but there was nothing unusual. This revelation left all the guys stunned. The Sect Master emphasized that he had checked several times, yet Spirit Immortal appeared perfectly normal. The Sect Master voiced his confusion, expressing a lack of understanding regarding why Spirit Immortal had suddenly become furious, and then quickly calmed down. A guy inquired whether it appeared that Spirit Immortal was specifically targeting the young disciples, wondering if someone among them had angered it. A girl responded, stating that such a scenario was impossible. She questioned why, if one of the disciples had genuinely provoked Spirit Immortal, the creature would stop after just one attack. The Sect Master explained that Spirit Immortal was an ancient spiritual beast known for its high intelligence. The Sect Master remarked that Spirit Immortal had never exhibited such behavior in the last 1,000 years, indicating there must be a reason behind it. At that moment, an old man named Zheng Shu Cheng, the chief of Whirling Wind Peak, arrived. He asked the Sect Master if he had possibly reached a conclusion. The Sect Master responded that he was just as perplexed. Recognizing the significance of Spirit Immortal as their guardian beast, the Sect Master announced his intention to employ their secret communication technique to investigate the matter. The Sect Master explained that using this technique should allow him to communicate with Spirit Immortal.
However, just as he was about to initiate the communication, Spirit Immortal fell asleep, leaving him with no other option. The Sectmaster assured everyone that there was nothing more they could do at that moment and advised them not to worry. He mentioned that once Spirit Immortal woke up, they would attempt the communication again. The Sectmaster then shifted the focus to another matter he needed to discuss with them. The Sectmaster inquired if everyone had heard of the ancient Bat Colony Cavern in Kongsang Mountain, located 3,000 miles east of their current location. Zung questioned why the Sectmaster was suddenly bringing up such a remote place. In response, the Sectmaster explained that Zung might not be aware that despite its seemingly deserted appearance, the ancient Bat Colony Cavern used to be a significant base for the cult. About half a year ago, he had received a letter from Fenxiang Valley, indicating that there were recent signs of cultist activities near the ancient Bat Colony Cavern. The Sectmaster explained that after careful consideration, he had dispatched Yikai to investigate the ancient Bat Colony Cavern. Several months later, Yikai sent a letter back, confirming that he had indeed found cultists near the cave, and their objectives were shocking. According to Yikai's letter, 800 years ago, the ancient Bat Colony Cavern served as the main base for a branch of the demon cult known as Blood Hall. The sect master conveyed that, based on Blood Hall's records, despite their righteous people successfully eliminating key figures during the battle in the ancient Bat Colony Cavern 800 years ago, there was still an extremely well-hidden chamber in the Million Bats Cave. This secret chamber supposedly housed numerous rare treasures and books, remaining undiscovered by anyone. The sect master noted that the credibility of this rumor was uncertain, but to his knowledge, righteous individuals hadn't found anything in the ancient Bat Colony Cavern since the significant battle eight centuries prior. The sect master expressed concern that if there indeed was a hidden chamber, there might be something extremely sinister within it that they must not overlook. Zung inquired about the nature of this sinister thing and why it was so crucial. The sect master then revealed the name, the Blood Devouring Orb. Kang Song questioned whether that thing hadn't disappeared when Elder Blackheart died. The sect master explained that although Elder Blackheart was long dead, the orb was likely still out there somewhere. The sect master shared that upon receiving Yikai's letter, he promptly notified Fengsheng Valley and Tianyin Temple. Soon after, they responded, stating that they had sent their exceptional disciples to Kongsang Mountain to thwart the cultists. The group inquired about their plan of action. The sect master mentioned that he had heard that in the past 100 years, both Tianyin Temple and Fengxiang Valley had produced a couple of extraordinary disciples with brilliant talent. The sect master announced that as the Qingyun tournament was on the horizon, he intended to dispatch the top four disciples to Kongsang Mountain. He expressed the urgency of taking action promptly to maintain their role as leaders of justice. The sect master emphasized that if they failed to act swiftly, they might jeopardize their positions, bringing shame upon all the previous grandmasters. Kang Song acknowledged that it was the best idea, and everyone agreed with the plan. Later, as the others rested, Xiao Fan woke up and noticed his monkey and dog running out of the window. He swiftly followed them and found Linger heading somewhere. Xiao Fan wondered where Senior was going, but initially thought he should stay out of it. Despite that, he found himself following her. Eventually, he arrived at the location where Linger was heading and unexpectedly saw Senior Chi there. Observing Linger meeting with Senior Chi privately, Xiao Fan couldn't help but wonder what was happening. Xiao Fan sighed, returning from the scene. He pondered on the fact that they had spent five years together, yet Chi and Linger, who had just met, were meeting in such a manner. Xiao Fan couldn't decide whether to laugh at the world or at himself. While walking near the river, he suddenly noticed Spirit Immortal approaching, and shock overcame him. As Spirit Immortal drew near, Xiao Fan stumbled and fell to the ground his stick clattering down as well. Xiao Fan speculated that since the sect master wasn't present this time, he might meet his end. Spirit Immortal focused its attention on Xiao Fan's stick, while Xiao Fan, equally scared and intrigued, stared back at Spirit Immortal. He wondered if Spirit Immortal, after living for thousands of years, had become senile or if it was akin to the lively dog on Great Bamboo Peak, staying young at heart despite its age. Perplexed, Xiao Fan questioned why Spirit Immortal was so interested in the fire poker. As Spirit Immortal approached the fire poker, Xiao Fan was left stunned. The next morning, all the guys were heading out, and Xiao Fan had his monkey perched on his shoulder. Another guy approached and attempted to play with the monkey, resulting in the monkey getting agitated. When the monkey tried to strike the guy, he quickly stepped back, acknowledging it was a close call. Xiao Fan apologized on behalf of the monkey, and the guy reassured Xiao Fan, stating it was okay. The guy admitted it was his fault for being careless, forgetting that the three-eyed monkey had a bad temper and tended to attack people. Xiao Fan was shocked upon learning about the three-eyed nature of his monkey. The guy inquired if Xiao Fan was unaware that his monkey was the three-eyed monkey. In response, Xiao Fan questioned what a three-eyed monkey was. The guy expressed surprise, pointing out that Xiao Fan didn't even know about the three-eyed monkey he was keeping as a pet. Xiao Fan explained that he encountered the monkey while chopping bamboo in the forest and admitted to pelting it with pine cones a couple of times before deciding to bring it back with him. Xiao Fan found himself in a situation where he spoke to a guy. When the guy addressed him with respect, calling him senior, Xiao Fan politely told him to just speak freely without using such formal titles. The guy, named Zheng Shushu, appreciated Xiao Fan's friendly demeanor. 
Zheng Shushu then mentioned that he was a disciple of the Whirling Wind Peak and asked Xiaofan for his name. Xiaofan shared some details about himself and inquired about the addition of Shu in his name, suggesting it meant uncle. Shushu responded, clarifying that Shu in his name actually meant book, not uncle. He explained that his father whimsically named him Shushu, and now it seemed like this choice would be a lifelong quirk, something he'd have to live with. Xiaofan commented that Shushu must have a strong interest in reading. Shushu agreed, stating that without intending to boast, he held the record for reading the most books on the Whirling Wind Peak. He added that although he focused on peculiar anecdotes and folklore, his father was somewhat displeased with his reading choices. Shushu inquired if Xiaofan was truly unaware that his monkey possessed three eyes. Xiaofan responded negatively, stating he thought it was an ordinary monkey. However, the monkey unexpectedly tugged at Xiaofan's hair, prompting him to label it as a mischievous creature. Disagreeing, Shushu insisted that the monkey was clever. Xiaofan, perplexed, questioned why Shushu considered the monkey smart. Shushu explained that despite its ordinary appearance, the monkey's intelligence made it a rare magical beast. Shushu questioned Xiaofan if he had observed the small vertical mark on the monkey's forehead between its eyes. Xiaofan acknowledged noticing the subtle detail and expressed amazement. Shushu then shared his knowledge, mentioning that he had read in the Magical Beasts chapter of the Legends of Immortals and Devils that the three-eyed monkey was an unusual magical creature. He explained that although it appeared like an ordinary monkey in its youth, as it matured, the third eye on its forehead would open, granting it magical abilities. Shushu explained that the three-eyed monkey not only had the capability to learn the magic of the five elements, but could also see things thousands of miles away. He clarified that the term clairvoyance referred to this unique ability of the three-eyed monkey. Xiaofan, holding the monkey in his hand, observed it closely, wondering if this seemingly ill-tempered monkey was truly that extraordinary. Curious, Xiaofan winked at the monkey, prompting it to gracefully descend from his arm. Shushu inquired if Xiaofan was also participating in the tournament. Xiaofan confirmed and returned the question to Shushu. Shushu shared that he too was there for the tournament, mentioning that he drew number 33 the previous day. He expressed his curiosity about Xiaofan's assigned number and hoped they wouldn't be opponents for the day. Xiaofan reassured him, stating that he drew the number one. Shushu inquired if Xiaofan was the disciple from the Great Bamboo Peak the previous day. Xiaofan affirmed that he was. Shushu expressed admiration, stating that Xiaofan was fortunate. He anticipated that their potential match might only happen in the final, acknowledging it would be challenging. Xiaofan, smiling, humbly mentioned that due to his limited skills, he was certain to be eliminated in the second round. Xiaofan found himself in a cheerful moment with his friend Shushu, who mentioned the possibility of failing the first round, leading to laughter between them. Darren, noticing the interaction, called Xiaofan over. Upon bidding farewell to Xiaofan, Xiaofan assured him they would meet again. When Darren inquired about the conversation, Xiaofan casually shared that he had met a senior from Whirling Wind Peak named Zheng Shushu. Darren experienced a moment of surprise upon learning the name Zheng Shushu. He revealed that Shushu was the sole son of Zhen Shucheng, the chief of Whirling Wind Peak. Darren went on to mention that he had heard about Shushu's exceptional talents, extensive knowledge, and high level of cultivation. Shushu was recognized as one of the prominent contenders for the winning position at that time. After learning this news, Xiaofan was shocked. The poster got an upgrade, displaying the names of all the candidates. But to Bishu's disappointment, his name was conspicuously absent. Bishu voiced his frustration, labeling it as unfair. Suddenly their master, mistress, and linger arrived. Master sternly told Bishu to be quiet while Mistress emphasized that the upcoming match was approaching and everyone needed to give their best effort to make their mentors proud. In response, all the guys enthusiastically agreed, expressing their commitment loudly. The sect master declared the commencement of the tournament. Xiaofan's mind wandered to the moment when Linger and Chi had a private meeting. Lost in thought, Xiaofan began heading outside. However, Bishu interrupted him, urging him to focus as the match had already begun. Realizing it was not the time for contemplation, Xiaofan acknowledged Bishu's advice. Bishu informed Xiaofan that Junior Linger was currently participating in a match, and they should go watch. Xiaofan agreed, and together they proceeded to the location of the ongoing match. Linger stood in place when a fellow named Shen Tiandu, a member of Daybreak Peak, approached. Shen's companions praised his skills, expressing confidence in his victory. Linger Sr. observed the scene while glancing at Master Tian and Mistress Su. Linger politely asked Shen for some guidance, expressing hope for his mercy. Shen responded with a similar sentiment, and both participants prepared for the match. Linger conjured her red cloth magic, while Shen unsheathed his magic sword. After seeing Shen's sword, Mr. Su grew a bit concerned and mentioned that it was an earth-type magical weapon, similar to Linger's amber scarlet sash. Master Tian added that the outcome would likely depend on the cultivator with the higher skill level. He questioned the existence of a superior earth-type weapon to Linger's amber scarlet sash within the Qingyun sect. Mr. Su dismissed the talk as nonsense, urging them to focus on the match. Linger and Shen commenced their fight. Linger skillfully manipulated his sash with a gesture, causing it to circle around his sword. 
Shen adeptly defended against Linger's attack and countered by pushing her back with his sword. Mistress Su remarked on Shen's impressive cultivation, acknowledging his skill. Shen's companions loudly praised his performance, claiming he was doing exceptionally well. Bishu, however, countered that louder cheers didn't necessarily indicate superiority. Xiao Fan felt a sense of concern for Linger's well-being. Linger used his sashes to hurl a large stone toward Shen, but Shen swiftly leaped over it and embedded his sword into the stone. This unexpected move left Linger in shock. Shen, displaying his prowess, transformed the large stone into small fiery fragments. Xiao Fan too was stunned by this display of skill. Shen's companions praised his performance, expressing satisfaction. Undeterred, Linger and Shen continued to unleash their respective magical abilities. Linger threw his sashes toward Shen once again, creating a sizable circle around him. Observing Shen's companions expressing concern, Linger responded by launching a large fire sash in Shen's direction. As Shen attempted to free himself from the sashes, Linger deftly manipulated them with a gesture, delivering a powerful blow to Shen. The impact was substantial, causing Shen to tumble out of the fighting ring. Shen Sr. promptly instructed the other members to go and assist their fallen comrade. The group of individuals approached Shen to assist him in getting up. Linger also emerged from the fighting ring and complimented Shen on the good fight. Shen, acknowledging Linger's talent, expressed his genuine admiration. Shen's seniors approached master and mistress, noting that despite their daughter's youth, she displayed remarkable talent as a cultivator. He playfully expressed a touch of jealousy, and Master Tian responded with laughter, expressing gratitude. Xiao Fan called out to Linger, but she didn't linger near him. Instead, she headed straight to Qi. The two met, and Qi greeted Linger with visible happiness. Observing them, Xiao Fan experienced a sense of sadness. Suddenly, Zeng arrived and placed a hand on Xiao Fan's shoulder, surprising him. Xiao Fan turned to look at Zeng, and his monkey, sensing the interaction, hopped down from Xiao Fan's shoulder. The monkey made a gesture to a nearby dog and the two scampered away. Despite Xiao Fan's attempts to stop them, Zeng reassured him, mentioning that the three-eyed monkey was clever and wouldn't get lost. Xiao Fan speculated that the mischievous monkey was likely heading to the kitchen to pilfer food once again. Zeng inquired about what was bothering Xiao Fan, to which Xiao Fan casually replied that it was nothing. Xiao Fan then asked if Zeng didn't have a match today and questioned how he found the time to seek him out. Zeng explained that his match had concluded, leaving him with some free time, and upon spotting Xiao Fan, he decided to come over. Xiao Fan expressed surprise that Zeng's match had already ended and inquired about the outcome. Zeng humbly replied that he was fortunate and emerged victorious. Xiao Fan questioned whether Zeng's cultivation was exceptionally high. Zeng, in response, dismissed the notion, stating that his humble cultivation wasn't worth mentioning. He shared that if it weren't for his father constantly urging him to cultivate, he wouldn't bother with it. Placing a hand on Xiao Fan's shoulder, Zeng remarked that he genuinely didn't anticipate finding someone weaker than himself in the tournament. Xiao Fan remarked that there were plenty of people weaker than him. Zeng responded expressing that he wasn't overly ambitious, not hoping to be the ultimate winner. However, he conveyed his interest in Xiao Fan's three-eyed monkey and inquired about the possibility of obtaining it. Xiao Fan promptly told him to cease and asserted that he wouldn't part with his monkey. Zeng mentioned that he wanted to make a trade, offering something in return. Unbeknownst to Xiao Fan, Zeng had a collection of fascinating pets on Whirling Wind Peak. These included a three-legged rabbit, a black and white peacock, a shellless turtle, and a snake with wings. Xiao Fan was taken aback and questioned if such peculiar animals truly existed. Zeng assured him that they did, and shared that acquiring these precious pets had been a challenging endeavor. Despite his efforts, Zeng revealed that he had even faced criticism from his father for bringing these unique creatures home. Although Zeng mentioned his willingness to trade, he revealed that his most cherished pet was his three-eyed monkey. He expressed a desire to exchange it for something Xiao Fan valued. However, Xiao Fan declined, explaining that the three-eyed monkey held special significance for him. Even if Zeng offered his black and white rabbit or shellless peacock, Xiao Fan remained steadfast in his decision. Zeng clarified that the pets in question were actually a three-legged rabbit, a black and white peacock, and a turtle without a shell. Despite Xiao Fan's lack of interest in Zeng's pets, he made it clear that he wasn't interested in the exchange. Zeng then took Xiao Fan aside and presented a book to him. He expressed his belief that Xiao Fan would enjoy it. Puzzled, Xiao Fan wondered what the book could be, ruling out the possibility of it being an extremely powerful technique. Xiao Fan returned the book to Zeng, expressing his inability to accept such a valuable item. He mentioned feeling not smart enough to learn from it and insisted that he didn't want to trade his three-eyed monkey for the book. Xiao Fan requested Zeng to put the book back. However, Zeng insisted that Xiao Fan should at least take a look at it. Upon opening the book, Xiao Fan was shocked to find its contents disappointing. Perplexed, he questioned Zeng about why he would have read such a book. Zeng nonchalantly responded, asking what was wrong with reading it. He claimed the book was unique and that he had spent a significant amount on it. Zeng confidently asserted that reading it would make Xiao Fan the most popular boy among the girls. However, Xiao Fan firmly refused, stating that he had no intention of taking the undesirable book. Zeng expressed a feeling of talking to a wooden figure as he tried to convince Xiao Fan about the book. Moving on, Zeng informed Xiao Fan that it was time to go and watch the most popular contestants in the tournament.
Xiaofan speculated if it was Senior Qi Hao from Head Peak. Zeng confirmed that Senior Qi was indeed renowned for his strength, but he hinted that there was another contestant who garnered even more attention. Curious, Xiaofan inquired about the identity of the other contestant. Zeng, holding Xiaofan's hand, urged him to come along and promised that he would find out if they went together. Upon reaching the crowded fight ring once again, Xiaofan noted the large crowd and deduced that the person must be genuinely popular. Zeng remarked on the significant number of people present and suggested they move forward to get a better view. A group of guys conversed about Minor Bamboo Peak, noting that it always attracted many beautiful women. One of them mentioned Lu Shuichi, acclaimed as the most beautiful girl in 500 years. Another guy shared that he had seen her at Yuqing Hall and found her to be truly breathtakingly beautiful. Zeng remarked on the lack of good spots left and regretted not waiting there the previous night. Just then, Zeng spotted his senior, and the senior playfully commented on Zeng's tardiness at the gathering. Zeng took Xiaofan by the hand and led him to a place where the seniors were seated. To their surprise, they both were stunned by what they saw. Shortly after, a girl named Lu Shuechi arrived, capturing the attention of everyone around. The crowd expressed joy at her presence. Zeng gestured to Xiaofan to take a look at the girl. Xiaofan questioned if she was the highly anticipated contestant Zeng mentioned. Zeng replied that she might not be the most promising one, as he had heard that Lu hadn't been part of the tournament for long, and her cultivation level was challenging to discern. Despite Zeng's remarks, the general consensus among the crowd was that Lu Shuechi would be the clear winner if it were a beauty pageant. Xiaofan, noticing Zeng's drooling expression, jokingly told him that he looked quite creepy. Zeng defended himself, saying he was still better than others. He also noted that it wasn't surprising considering the Qingyun sect had been actively recruiting many young disciples in recent years. Zeng mentioned that there were around 300 to 400 disciples at their age, emphasizing that they were still young and easily tempted. Curious, Zeng asked Xiaofan why he was looking at him instead of the others, reminding him that he brought him there as a friend. As the match commenced, Lu took flight towards the ring, leaving the onlookers astonished. A participant in the ring introduced himself as Fang Chao from Dragonhead Peak. Fang Chao expressed his honor to spar with Lu, leaving Xiaofan surprised, wondering when the guy got into the arena. Zeng amused, laughed, and remarked that he too was captivated by her, playfully calling Xiaofan a perv and pointing out their shared interest. Xiaofan retorted, telling Zeng to be quiet and claiming he simply wasn't paying attention. Zeng grinned mischievously. Lu introduced herself to Fang, mentioning she was from Bamboo Peak named Lu Shuechi, and hoped for his guidance. Xiaofan couldn't help but gaze at her, and others in the crowd were also watching them both. Fang informed Lu that he was about to make a move to strike her. This statement prompted laughter from the onlookers. Perplexed, Xiaofan questioned Zeng about why he was laughing. Zeng explained that one wouldn't be afraid of causing harm to an opponent in the arena, and Fang had even warned Lu to be cautious. Meanwhile, a girl named Shui Yue commented to Kang Sang that he seemed displeased about something. In response, Kang Sang remarked that all Shui Yue disciples were charming. Expressing her surprise, she mentioned that she had not realized there were so many perverted hooligans in Qingyun sect until that moment. When Kang Sang glanced in her direction, the sect master intervened, stating that it was enough. The sect master pointed out that both of them were hundreds of years old and shouldn't argue in front of their disciples. Fang hurled his sword at Lu, initiating an attack, but Lu skillfully defended herself by using her own sword to alter the direction of Fang's weapon with her power. After redirecting Fang's sword, Lu counterattacked by throwing her own sword at him. Fang was astonished by the display of her strength. Zeng commented on Lu's impressive abilities, noting her power. Xiaofan chimed in, expressing admiration for Lu's skills and comparing her to Senior Linger. In response to Lu's sword throw, Fang erected three ice walls as a defense, but Lu's sword effortlessly broke through each one. Stunned, Fang realized that even three ice walls couldn't halt Lu's advance. He pondered on whether Junior Lu's strength was genuinely this formidable. In an attempt to stop Lu's sword, Fang conjured another magic, but the sword continued, resulting in a powerful explosion that shocked everyone present. When the dust settled, Fang was on the ground, and Lu was suspended in the air. Fang's sword lay broken. His companions rushed to his aid and helped him up, the angered guys complained that the woman had gone too far. Meanwhile, Lu approached her senior girl, greeting her respectfully. Xiaofan expressed surprise at how quickly the match had concluded. Zeng commented on the unexpected appearance of the divine sword Tianya. Intrigued, Xiaofan inquired about Tianya. Zeng explained that Tianya was the sword used by Lu Shuichi in the recent match, recalling having read about it in the Ten Chapters of Rare Treasures. Zeng explained that Tianya made its first appearance a thousand years ago in the hands of an independent Taoist named Kukshin. Legend has it that the sword was a celestial piece of iron that descended from the heavens to the mortal realm. Zeng shared that Taoist Kushin stumbled upon it accidentally in the Arctic ice plain and crafted it into a sword. He continued, stating that during the great battle between the forces of good and evil at that time, the righteous group was led by their Qingyun's grandmaster named Qingye. The Taoist Kukshin gained considerable fame, particularly for wielding his divine sword Tianya. Zeng explained that Kukshin engaged in a three-day battle with the malefic cultist Elder Blackheart, successfully eliminating one of their strongest adversaries. 
He added that during that time, it was believed that only the divine sword Tianya could withstand the sinister weapon of the cult, known as the Blood Devouring Orb. Since that pivotal moment, Tianya had earned a reputation as one of the most renowned divine weapons among the righteous. After Taoist Kukshin's passing, Zheng had heard that the Tianya sword had gone missing. He admitted not knowing it was in the possession of Minor Bamboo Peak. Zheng expressed concern, stating that with Lu Xuechi wielding such a powerful weapon, their chances in the tournament seemed bleak. Xiao Fan, perplexed, reminded Zheng that he initially seemed uninterested in the tournament and questioned why he now sounded disappointed. Zheng responded, saying that if they could truly make it to the end, wouldn't that be an awesome achievement? As they examined the list, Bishu expressed surprise, mentioning that except for Xiao Fan, both Senior Darren and Junior Linger Daji had successfully advanced to the next round. He noted that this achievement marked the best record for the Great Bamboo Peak, bringing joy to Master Tian. Upon checking the list, Xiao Fan noticed that his next opponent was named Chu Yu Hong. Curious, he asked Darren about Chu Yu Hong and inquired whether he was strong. Darren admitted not knowing much about him but mentioned that Chu Yu Hong was from Daybreak Peak. Darren assured Xiao Fan not to worry, emphasizing that they had little information about Chu Yu Hong's cultivation level. Darren shared that he had also felt nervous during his initial participation in the tournament, assuring Xiao Fan that the anxiety would ease once he entered the arena. Xiao Fan agreed. Bishu suggested making a bet on whether Xiao Fan would emerge victorious this time. One person agreed, betting on Xiao Fan's loss, and several others joined in, wagering that Xiao Fan would be defeated. Darren, in an angry tone, questioned what they were doing, expressing frustration that Xiao Fan's match was about to start and that they shouldn't discourage him like that. Xiao Fan felt relieved hearing Darren's support. Bishu clarified that he was just joking and urged Xiao Fan not to tell the master. Others chimed in, agreeing with Darren's sentiment. Later, Darren took Bishu aside, expressing that he had already discouraged Xiao Fan. He suggested making a bet of five shares as well. Master Tian commended Xiao Fan for his performance the previous day but cautioned him about the tougher competition in the second round, advising him to be careful. Xiao Fan acknowledged the advice. Mistress Su reminded Xiao Fan that it was his first fight and encouraged him to stay cautious. Xiao Fan assured her that he would. Linger noticed Xiao Fan's nervousness, observing the beads of sweat on his forehead. Darren mentioned to Mistress Su that he had tried to uplift Xiao Fan's spirits, but wasn't successful, suggesting that perhaps she could handle the task better. Linger told Xiao Fan that she would soon have her own fight and wouldn't be able to cheer him on, advising him to do his best and avoid getting hurt. Just then, Jing Yu arrived, calling out to Xiao Fan, who became elated upon seeing Jing Yu. Xiao Fan expressed his curiosity, wondering why he couldn't find Jing Yu earlier. Jing Yu explained that he had another match scheduled at the Can Arena for the day, so he had arrived early to prepare. Jing Yu inquired if Xiao Fan also had a match and asked in which arena he would be fighting. Xiao Fan informed him that he would be at the Gen Arena, and the match was about to start, so Jing Yu couldn't cheer him on. Xiao Fan wished him well, and Jing Yu playfully commented that Xiao Fan was being overly cautious. Xiao Fan mentioned that there were few people in his branch, and most of them had their own matches scheduled for the day. He noted that Master and Mistress had gone to watch Senior Linger's match. Jing Yu placed his hand on Xiao Fan's shoulder, but Xiao Fan assured him it was fine. Xiao Fan shared that he was there to enjoy the atmosphere, and emphasized that he was the one who needed to give his best. He expressed the importance of not letting people perceive Temple Village as a place with only losers. Jing Yu informed Xiao Fan that his match was about to begin, and he had to leave. He mentioned that if his match ended quickly, he would come to watch Xiao Fan's match. After Jing Yu left, Xiao Fan acknowledged that if his match concluded swiftly and Jing Yu was still available, it would be quite unlikely. Xiao Fan then made his way to the arena. After reaching the arena, he noticed the warmth emanating from the floor, and a guy stood before him. Xiao Fan introduced himself as Zhang Xiao Fan from the Great Bamboo Peak, while the other guy named Chu revealed that he was a senior to Xiao Fan. Chu remarked that despite Xiao Fan's youth, he could still maintain composure and fearlessness right before the match. Chu commented that Xiao Fan appeared much more composed than he himself was in the past, expressing his admiration. Xiao Fan honestly admitted that he had been spacing out, leading to laughter from his peers. Despite this, Chu complimented Xiao Fan on his good fight. Chu then proudly showed Xiao Fan his sword named Xiao Yang. Observing Chu's sword, Xiao Fan thought it looked particularly unique. Inspired, Xiao Fan took out his fire poker. However, the others burst into laughter, teasing the Great Bamboo Peak members for being unconventional. They recounted an incident from the previous day where someone used dice as a weapon and became a source of amusement. Today, with Xiao Fan wielding a fire poker, they found it equally amusing and labeled members of the Great Bamboo Peak as weirdos. The laughter at Xiao Fan continued, with even Darren joining in, unable to control his amusement. Darren asked if the fire poker was genuinely Xiao Fan's weapon, eliciting more laughter from the group. As the laughter echoed, Xiao Fan couldn't help but reflect on his family, including his father, mother, and Linger. Contemplating the loneliest moments in life, he wondered if facing the indifference of the entire world was one of those moments. Considering the crowd laughing at him, he questioned whether his blood would freeze or boil. Taking a deep breath, Xiao Fan composed himself.
When Chu threw his sword at Xiao Fan, blood started to trickle from Xiao Fan's mouth, and his blood drops fell onto the fire poker. Suddenly a large circle of fire formed automatically. The onlookers began to express confidence that Senior would win the match. Zeng encouraged Xiao Fan, emphasizing the importance of winning. Abruptly, the large fire circle enveloped Xiao Fan, and his eyes became filled with a fiery glow. Xiao Fan raised his fire poker, creating a powerful magical effect. Upon witnessing Xiao Fan's magical display, Chu was left shocked and frightened, struggling to comprehend what was happening. Xiao Fan roared, and the onlookers, equally stunned, expressed confusion, noting they couldn't see anything in the arena. To their surprise, Xiao Fan emerged victorious in the match, leaving Chu defeated on the floor. The observers were bewildered, commenting on the sudden and one-sided nature of the battle. Zeng, thrilled by Xiao Fan's strength, expressed his joy at the outcome. Zeng, impressed, remarked that Xiao Fan appeared much stronger than he initially seemed. Stepping into the ring, Zeng admitted he didn't realize Xiao Fan was that powerful. Meanwhile, Chu's companions arrived to retrieve him from the floor. Chu, acknowledging his defeat, told Xiao Fan that he had been waiting for this moment and urged him to leave the arena. Xiao Fan, still stunned, questioned if he had actually won. Zeng inquired whether the fire had harmed him, and Xiao Fan reassured him that it hadn't, signaling his readiness to descend from the arena. Xiao Fan inquired why Zeng was there to watch his fight. Zeng responded that his own match hadn't started yet, so he had nothing else to do. Curious, Zeng questioned why Xiao Fan's three-eyed monkey wasn't present that day. Xiao Fan explained that he had no idea. The monkey probably ran off with the dog again. Reflecting on the situation, Xiao Fan suspected that although Zeng claimed to have come to watch his fight, he was more likely there for the monkey. As the other fights unfolded, Zeng suddenly took hold of Xiao Fan's hand, realizing he had forgotten something while watching Xiao Fan's match. Urging Xiao Fan to come with him, Zeng mentioned that Lu Xuechi's match was currently underway and they needed to get there on time. Xiao Fan observed that among the sparse audience below his arena, none of his seniors or elders were present, except for the disciple from Daybreak Peak, a friend he had only known for two days, the sole individual cheering for him. Xiao Fan expressed gratitude to Zeng for being there, to which Zeng modestly responded that it wasn't worth mentioning. Zeng playfully remarked that if Xiao Fan was so touched, what about the monkey? Xiao Fan then urged him to quickly join them to watch Lu Xuechi's match. Upon their arrival, they discovered only a few people and realized the match had concluded. Zeng pointed out that they were tardy, as the match had already ended. Zeng spotted his seniors and called out to them. His senior inquired if Zeng insisted on watching Lu Xuechi's match. Zeng explained that he had something to attend to and requested them to first inform him about the outcome of the match. His senior shared that it was evident that even senior Duan Lei from the sky-reaching peak couldn't compete with Tianya. Zeng was taken aback upon learning that Duan had lost against her. Xiao Fan inquired if senior Duan Lei was genuinely formidable. Zeng responded, explaining that Duan Lei was an exceptional disciple from the main branch and a top contender for the winning position this time. However, his senior dismissed the significance, stating that the divine sword Tianya was simply too potent. Senior Duan's defeat was swift, marked by a few flashes of blue light and some crashing noises. He mentioned that whether one believed it or not, Lu Xuechi didn't even unsheathe her Tianya sword until the very end. Zeng questioned the purpose of the fight then, wondering who could possibly compete against her. His senior responded, explaining that for a divine sword like Tianya, its power persisted even when sheathed. He further noted that Lu Xuechi's cultivation was remarkably impressive. He mentioned that he had heard all of that from the master. Zeng inquired if the information came from his dad. The person affirmed and conveyed that Zeng's dad mentioned this girl had likely surpassed level 8 of the Jade Pure Realm. He added that she might have even advanced to level 9 by now. Xiao Fan observed that despite the guy's claims of indifference to the results, it was evident that he was quite invested in the tournament. Zeng remarked that it seemed they were entirely without hope this time. Xiao Fan questioned if Zeng had fought today, to which Zeng replied that his match was not scheduled yet, but he needed to head over soon. Xiao Fan inquired about Xiao Fan's plans, and he mentioned he had to report to his master and mistress, despite winning by luck. Zeng assured Xiao Fan that he would find him when he was free, and Xiao Fan agreed. Xiao Fan arrived to provide an update, and Bishu questioned if he was stating that, just as he was about to lose his match, Chu Yunhong suddenly fell ill and passed out with his face covered in blood. Xiao Fan, putting his hands on his ears, affirmed and mentioned that all four of them had already asked him about it 22 times. He questioned why they were still inquiring, and reiterated that he was telling the truth. Bishu persisted, asking the same question again, and Xiao Fan responded by noting it was the 23rd time he was being asked. Linger arrived and questioned why Bishu kept pressing the matter, mentioning that Xiao Fan wouldn't lie about it. Linger attributed Xiao Fan's success to sheer luck, making it understandable that they found it hard to believe. Mistress inquired about the master's opinion, and Master Tina remarked that even if he claimed Xiao Fan won with skill, would she believe it? Mistress Su commented that their disciple was simply unusually lucky. Sitting by the riverbank at night, Xiao Fan contemplated the upcoming battle. Tomorrow, Senior Linger would face Lu Xuechi, who had displayed immense power by destroying her opponent's magical weapon on the first day. Xiao Fan wondered if Linger could emerge victorious, and earnestly hoped for her safety.
Reflecting on his own inability to ensure his well-being, he questioned whether he was truly in a position to worry about someone else. Xiao Fan considered that many people were already looking out for Linger. Suddenly, he heard a voice and quickly moved behind a stone. Kang Song and other seniors were walking nearby. Kang Song observed that it was quite late and questioned why the sect master had summoned them. Xiao Fan quietly observed them. Kang Song mentioned hearing that the sect master had employed secret techniques to communicate with a spirit immortal, likely discovering something important and gathering them to discuss it. They departed from the area. Xiao Fan pondered that the spirit immortal must be resting soundly now. Pulling out his fire poker, he reflected on Zeng's words. Zeng had mentioned that some magical weapons were refined with the owner's blood to imbue them with malefic aura. According to Zeng, the user of such a weapon would feel a strong connection, as if it were a part of their body. However, the book stated that this method was considered unholy, mostly used for crafting sinister and wicked weapons, and was not tolerated by righteous minds. Zeng had explained to him that such a magical weapon could only be wielded by its owner, unlike their magical weapons that could be controlled by seniors with high cultivation. Xiao Fan gazed at the fire poker and contemplated that even if it was considered a wicked weapon, it still possessed great power. He questioned his worthiness for something like that and wondered if a less imposing tool, like the seemingly less intimidating fire poker, might be more suitable for him. Xiao Fan questioned who he thought he was to use a magical weapon, expressing disbelief at the idea. Suddenly, the fire poker lifted into the air, leaving Xiao Fan stunned. Simultaneously, something unusual occurred in the water, prompting Xiao Fan to wonder what was happening. Without hesitation, he swiftly ran away, realizing it was best to leave the area quickly. The next day brought the third round of the Seven Meridians Martial Contest. Xiao Fan found himself standing in the arena, surprised that his opponent for the day turned out to be one of Zeng Shusu's seniors. He wondered if Senior Linger's match had already started, hoping she wouldn't sustain any injuries. Soon, a participant named Peng Chang from Whirling Wind Peak stepped into the arena to face Xiao Fan. Xiao Fan extended his best wishes to Peng for good luck. Peng, acknowledging that Zeng had briefed him about Xiao Fan, assured him that he wouldn't inflict harm. Responding to Xiao Fan's encouragement to use his full power, Peng appeared taken aback. He then showcased his sword, Wugu, crafted from a thousand-year-old fire bronze, expressing the desire for a spirited and fair fight. Xiao Fan pulled out his fire poker, and the onlookers burst into laughter. Peng surrounded himself with a significant amount of fire, capturing Xiao Fan's attention. As Peng threw his sword towards Xiao Fan, Xiao Fan's fire poker lifted into the air, skillfully intercepting and stopping the incoming fire. The spectators were left astonished, declaring the scene to be truly unbelievable. Xiao Fan's friends praised him, calling him amazing. On the other side, Linger engaged in a fierce battle with Lu Xuechi. Linger unveiled her red magic cloth, causing concern for her mother. Master Tian reassured her, advising her to stay calm as he believed Linger would be okay. Suddenly, Xiao Fan arrived, appearing weak. Xiao Fan, perspiring heavily and bearing visible injuries, was questioned by the master about the source of his severe wounds. The master inquired, questioning if winning the match wasn't sufficient for his adversaries. The others were astonished, puzzled by Master Tian's words. Xiao Fan clarified that it wasn't the case, affirming his victory in the match, and then collapsed onto the floor. Reflecting on his childhood, Xiao Fan recalled a time when he ran through the jungle, with Jing Yu in pursuit, questioning his destination. As Xiao Fan continued running, Jing Yu challenged him to stop if he had the courage. Xiao Fan, feeling a bit foolish, responded by daring Jing Yu to come and catch him if he had the guts. As Xiao Fan sprinted, he eventually entered an old shelter and suddenly stumbled, falling to the floor. Jing Yu arrived and grabbed Xiao Fan, triumphantly stating that he had caught him. He asked if Xiao Fan had anything else to say. Xiao Fan, not willing to admit defeat, claimed that it didn't count because Jing Yu played unfairly. Jing Yu, puzzled, questioned how he played unfairly. Xiao Fan retorted, urging Jing Yu not to act ignorant, and questioned if he was suggesting he didn't place the door there. Jing Yu reminded him that they agreed the one who got caught would lose and asked if Xiao Fan would admit it. Xiao Fan firmly replied no. Jing Yu instructed him to admit that Xiao Fan had lost. Jing Yu grabbed Xiao Fan's neck, but suddenly Jing Yu felt something unusual and abruptly withdrew. Both of them were left stunned, and Jing Yu expressed confusion, asking, What happened? Jing Yu apologized to Xiao Fan, admitting he didn't know what had come over him. Xiao Fan reassured Jing Yu, saying it was okay. Then an elderly man arrived, and Xiao Fan inquired about his well being. The old man held some beads in his hand, and Xiao Fan gazed into them, witnessing the image of people lying lifeless on the ground. Abruptly, Xiao Fan woke up from his sleep. Linger noted that Xiao Fan had awakened. Master Tian checked Xiao Fan and reassured him that he should be fine now. Xiao Fan observed everyone standing around him and inquired about what had happened. Linger reminded him not to forget that earlier in the day, he had a match against Peng Chang from Whirling Wind Peak, and he passed out right after returning. She expressed relief that he was okay, but acknowledged it was a frightening experience. Xiao Fan examined himself, surprised at how quickly he had recovered and how unclear the situation seemed to be. Master Tian reassured Xiao Fan that the burns were merely external injuries and that the special medicine from the Qingyun sect had already healed them. Master Tian added that the only remaining injury was in Xiao Fan's chest. 
Due to a substantial impact, his bones and veins had been shaken, and Master Tian affirmed that with a few days of rest, Xiao Fan would fully recover. Mistress Su advised Xiao Fan to express gratitude to his master, stating that if it weren't for his master personally treating the wounds, the external injuries alone would have taken at least half a year to heal. Xiao Fan was surprised and apologized to Master Tian, attributing the trouble to his own incompetence. Master Tian countered, asserting that Xiao Fan was currently the most competent individual on the Great Bamboo Peak. Xiao Fan modestly remarked that all his seniors were far more skilled than him, and he didn't dare to compare himself. The onlookers observed him, and the mistress instructed a guy named Daxon to fetch a chair for senior Xiao Fan. Meanwhile, Darren sat there looking despondent. Xiao Fan inquired about what had happened to Darren, and Darren responded, revealing that the tournament had progressed to the fourth round, and he was the only one from their group who remained. Xiao Fan was taken aback and turned to Linger, inquiring if she had also lost her match. Linger confirmed that she too had lost. Master Tian summoned Xiao Fan, asking how he managed to improve his cultivation to such a level. Xiao Fan began recounting his journey, mentioning that when he was a child, an elderly man approached him and asked if he would like to learn a cultivation mantra. Curious, Xiao Fan inquired about the details of the mantra. The old man chuckled and explained that the mantra involved breathing and managing one's energy. He added that, after learning it, Xiao Fan would have to make a few promises. Xiao Fan inquired about those promises, and the old man specified that Xiao Fan mustn't divulge what happened that day to anyone including those closest to him. The old man asked if Xiao Fan could make that promise, and Xiao Fan affirmed that he understood, pledging not to disclose the information even if it meant facing death. The man instructed Xiao Fan to practice the mantra every day but in private, specifically at midnight when there was no one around. He emphasized that unless faced with a life-and-death situation, Xiao Fan must refrain from using the technique, or disasters would befall him. The man asked if Xiao Fan could adhere to these conditions, and Xiao Fan assured him with a yes, they both settled on the floor, and the man conveyed that throughout his life, he had never taken anyone as his disciple. However, fate had brought Xiao Fan to him, and he decided it was time to reveal his name. The man disclosed that his Dharma name was Puji, and he was a monk from Tianyin Temple. He inquired if Xiao Fan knew about Tianyin Temple, to which Xiao Fan shook his head in the negative. Puji remarked that Xiao Fan was truly a child. He then presented an orb, instructing Xiao Fan to keep it with him without letting anyone else see it. Puchi advised that once Xiao Fan had settled down, he should find a cliff and toss the orb off, allowing him to forget about it. Puchi emphasized that Xiao Fan must not mention the name he had just shared in front of anyone. Xiao Fan agreed to this condition. Puchi reflected on the intertwining of their fates and wondered if they would meet again in their next lives. He directed Xiao Fan to submit himself and address him as master. Xiao Fan followed the instruction, praising Puchi and acknowledging him as master. Xiao Fan informed the others that he wasn't particularly clever and his cultivation hadn't shown much progress in the past few years. A few days ago, he unexpectedly discovered the ability to make objects move. However, he hesitated to mention it to the master and mistress because he couldn't believe it himself. The revelation was unexpected for him. Master expressed surprise, mentioning that he hadn't anticipated Xiao Fan achieving such impressive results and becoming the center of attention. Xiao Fan disagreed with the master's assessment. Master clarified that for Xiao Fan to make objects move, his cultivation would need to be at least at level 4 of the pure jade realm. Master inquired with Darren, who informed him that he had only taught Xiao Fan the mantra for level 2. Master then requested Darren to approach Xiao Fan's master and inquire how Xiao Fan had managed to break through level 3 and reach level 4. Xiao Fan got down from the bed and stood in front of the master who asked him what had transpired. Xiao Fan admitted that the master had to punish him. Master admonished Xiao Fan, informing him that learning unauthorized techniques was one of the gravest taboos in the Qingyun sect. The punishment ranged from facing the wall and reflecting on his actions for decades to having his cultivation disabled and being expelled from Qingyun. Xiao Fan was stunned upon hearing this, realizing that when Senior Linger had given him the mantra, she hadn't disclosed these consequences. Xiao Fan apologized again and reiterated that the master needed to punish him. Suddenly, master struck Xiao Fan, causing him to fall to the floor, leaving everyone in shock. The onlookers pleaded with the master to forgive Xiao Fan. Darren took responsibility, admitting that he had failed to properly guide Xiao Fan and it was his fault. He implored the master to forgive Xiao Fan. Master Tian left the scene, and Mistress Su instructed everyone to take care of Xiao Fan while she checked on his master. She followed Master Tian. Xiao Fan remained on the floor, and Linger looked at him concernedly. Master Tian and Mistress Su emerged outside. Mistress Su inquired about Master Tian's well-being, expressing doubt that Xiao Fan might have fooled Darren, Linger, and the others, but couldn't deceive her. Mistress Su explained that the strike from Master Tian's sleeve was intended to shake the veins in Xiao Fan's chest, forcing out the clotted blood. She questioned why, despite being hundreds of years old, Master Tian remained so stubborn. Master Tian acknowledged the annoyance, admitting that he was indeed at fault. He criticized himself for acting as if he were wronged, portraying himself as the villain in the situation. Mistress Su pointed out that Master Tian must have also noticed Linger's peculiar behavior. 
Master Tian inquired about what she was suggesting. Mistress Su elaborated, stating that in the past five years, Yao Fan had never left the Great Bamboo Peak. Thus, the only possibility was that one of their disciples had taught him the mantra. Mistress Su observed that Linger and V had always been close friends. Knowing their affection for Linger, she concluded that Linger was the only one bold enough to teach Xiao Fan the mantra for level 3 in secret. Mistress Su emphasized Linger's protective nature towards Xiao Fan, questioning why she had remained silent during the recent events if she wasn't at fault. According to Mistress Su, there was no one else but Linger who could be responsible. Master Tian expressed his frustration, questioning how Xiao Fan dared to talk back to him in front of so many disciples and refused to tell the truth if it was indeed Linger's fault. Mistress Su placed her hand on Master Tian's shoulder, asking him if he wasn't just as stubborn. She advised him not to place all the blame on a kid. Mistress Su added that Xiao Fan had done it for Linger's sake, emphasizing that it was genuinely sweet of him. Mistress Su questioned Master Tian about his plans for handling the situation. She suggested that mistakes like this could be addressed in various ways, and for Linger's sake they should take it easy on Xiao Fan. She proposed asking Xiao Fan to return to the Great Bamboo Peak and face the wall at the back of the mountain for a few decades. Master Tian expressed concern, stating that their branch finally had an exceptional talent, and if Xiao Fan were to face the wall now, Kang Song and Shang Jingliang would reap all the benefits. Master Tian insisted that there was no way he would agree to Xiao Fan facing the wall, and he had to continue participating in the tournament the next day no matter what. Mistress Su commented that she knew he was a person with a tough exterior, but a kind heart. Master Tian recalled an important matter, mentioning that the previous night, the sect master had convened a meeting with the chiefs. The sect master had shared that, after communicating with the spirit immortal, he detected the spirit immortal acting out due to sensing a malefic aura from a sinister object. However, the spirit immortal couldn't sense it afterward. Mr. Su inquired about Master Tian's plan, now that the spirit immortal couldn't sense the malefic aura. Master Tian responded, saying there wasn't much they could do if the spirit immortal couldn't sense it anymore. He explained that the spirit immortal had lived for at least 6,000 years, and her sharpness had declined after her master had gone senile when she was 600 years old. According to Master Tian, it wasn't unusual for the spirit immortal to be less sharp than before. The next day, Bishu informed that Master had checked on Senior Darren in the morning. Bishu mentioned that the match between Senior Darren and Senior Cheng Jian the previous day had been intense, with one focusing entirely on offense and the other on defense. In the end, both contestants suffered heavy injuries, particularly to their meridians. Xiao Fan remarked to Bishu that if even Senior Darren couldn't defeat him, and he was pitted against Senior Chang Jin, would he fare even worse? Bishu responded, stating that under normal circumstances, it would imply Xiao Fan's loss. However, he added that most seniors had bet on Xiao Fan's loss in the previous two matches as well. Then a senior arrived, and Xiao Fan noticed that Zeng was accompanying them. Xiao Fan was surprised. Zeng informed Xiao Fan that Senior Peng wouldn't be present because he was still in his lodge recovering from injuries. Master Tian greeted them and the senior mentioned that he had heard about the exceptional talent from their branch named Zhang Xiaofan. He stated that Xiaofan had a match with his less skilled disciple Peng Chang, resulting in such severe injuries that he nearly lost his life. Xiaofan was shocked and inquired about the severity of Peng's injuries. The senior remarked that Xiaofan indeed had a capable disciple. Master Tian advised Xiaofan to greet the senior, but the senior declined, stating that there was no need for such formalities. Zeng expressed his surprise, mentioning that he had no idea Xiaofan was hiding his true strength. Zeng remarked that he had actually advised Senior Peng to take it easy on Xiao Fan, but he didn't anticipate that it would nearly lead to Senior Peng's demise. Xiao Fan denied making such a request. They then departed from the scene. As they approached the arena, Xiao Fan observed the crowd and commented that it seemed like Senior Chang Jian must be genuinely strong. A person commented that Senior Chang's cultivation was indeed profound, but most of the spectators were present for Xiao Fan. Xiao Fan was surprised. The individual mentioned that there were only eight contestants remaining in the tournament, and Xiao Fan was the biggest dark horse among them. They added that everyone was eager to get a glimpse of Xiao Fan and discover what kind of person he was. Master Tian approached Senior Fan and exchanged greetings. Senior Fan acknowledged Xiao Fan's unusual talent. Master Tian informed Xiao Fan that it was his turn to go up. Xiao Fan ascended the stage, glancing back at everyone with a hint of nervousness. Suddenly, a person approached Senior Fan and whispered something in his ear. Fan became somber, and Master Tian inquired about the reason. Senior Fan explained that their disciple Chang Jian couldn't participate due to the severe injuries sustained in yesterday's match leading him to forfeit today's match. The revelation left everyone astonished. Mistress Su remarked that she had heard about Xiao Fan's extraordinary luck. Both Master and Xiao Fan were equally stunned by the unexpected turn of events. Don't forget to like and comment for the next part. Join our Discord for the name of the book and subscribe for more videos from us.